exclusively by, by Pat Miller, who should be here in a minute. Um, we're going to start the meeting with that. We've got a budget update and discussion, um, and we also have the engagement in RCCP budgets. Um, is one of you willing to do the board evaluation? Thank you. All right. Um, we do have a time for community engagement um, right now. I don't know whether you're here for something particular or if you would prefer we have another community engagement after the um, State of the Schools presentation, which will, you know, so either way. Is there, is there something that one of you or more of you would like to say now? Okay. Um, it might take the entire five minutes. Well, um, we'll make time for everyone. Okay, thank you. Um, I prepared this because it's been on my mind since the beginning of the school year. I've been trying to get this to happen. My name is Kathleen Jeffrey Ernst. I am a Braintree property owner and I pay taxes. I've been trying to acquire a bus stop within one mile of our private road. During my quest, I have learned of several currently inactive bus stops within that radius. My concern is such that when my vehicle requires repairs, my children cannot attend school. I have learned through communications with the Vermont Agency of Education that all children residing in the state of Vermont between the ages of 6 and 16 must attend an approved curriculum. If they do not, they are in violation of the law. As I said, I've been trying to get this issue resolved since the very first week of school. I have gone through all the appropriate channels. I have been to the bus drivers, the director of transportation, the principal, and the superintendent. I have every communication documented as I was advised to do so by the Vermont Agency of Education. They advised me to make my communications via email because there would be a paper documented trail that way. I have forwarded all of my emails to Linda Lubold and apparently they were forwarded to the board. I do not know if that's accurate or not, but that's what I was told. Um, when my request to reactivate the bus stop at the junction of Rolling Rock Road and Braintree Hill Road was denied, I asked for an explanation from the superintendent. On October 15th, I was finally given, and I quote, after examining two other possible bus stops, parentheses, the only that offer a required turnaround, end parentheses, closer to your home, it has been determined that no change can be made. Bullet point, both myself and the bus director drove the potential routes and spoke with the road foreman on the conditions of those areas in the winter. Bullet point, in both cases, those are not safe for bus travel or do not provide adequate space for the buses to safely turn around. You may continue to drop your children off at the school as you have been doing or to avail yourself of any of the local bus stops in your area, of which there are none. Um, I asked for clarification of what exactly that meant and where exactly the areas of concern were and where I could approach the select board with those particular areas. I was told by the superintendent that the select board has no authority over the school district, but that he would be happy to answer any questions about the road evaluation if and only if the select board were to contact him directly. Then I was told, and I quote, the matter at my level is closed. I explained that the select board maintains the Braintree Hill Road and Rolling Rock Road, and that they wanted to know <coughs> specifically what it is about that stretch of road that is causing it to be deemed unsafe for bus travel. He refused to give me any explanation of how he came to his decision and told me not to contact him again. I attended the select board meeting and I was told that the road foreman said the current bus routes are maintained, plowed, and sanded prior to other areas, as should be. I was also told that if the school board would consider reinstating or reactivating the bus stop at the intersection of Rolling Rock Road and Braintree Hill Road, the select board would be more than happy to examine how to reform the current road maintenance routes to include the activated bus stop location, as it would only take one or two extra minutes of their time. I have not heard further from that and I have contacted over and over and over again and my kids need to be able to access the school. Basically we're trying to find out why we, uh, my grandparents, I'm representing her husband tonight, why they can't be picked up to where they are at the end of the road. We did receive, prior to the November meetings, some of those correspondences. Mm -hmm. um, because this is not on the agenda, we can't take any action tonight. Um, if you want to... I did ask for it to be put on the agenda back in October, I believe, and I was told that there was no room for it. And I was told that I could attend the next meeting in November, which I couldn't do because my son needed stitches. Okay, so, so the emergency room. At that point, um, I guess prior to the November meeting, we saw the correspondence, um, your email correspondence. We also were told that the Braintree Select Board uh, reviewed the bus routes and what have you, and they deemed that it was not safe 
for the bus to travel there. That is correct. What they said is currently at those times, because the maintenance schedule provides that they take care of the bus routes first. So if they were to extend out and cover the stretch of area that they used to cover in the same bus route, it would take one to two additional minutes and they would be more than happy to review well, that. Well, we can review this now. That was what we, what the select board had told us at that point. If okay. there's further, you know, you know, discussion between you and them, you know, we can review that, but now's not the time, you know, you're not, How because this is not on finished. the agenda. Um, you can request that in the next meeting, which will be January, whatever the second jet. My kids meeting. are still going to go without a bus until at least January. I'm, I'm actually to happy to, to speak because there's been some misinformation that's been communicated here quite clearly. Um, we did a significant investigation out of the kindness of our hearts to do everything that we could to help you out, including providing you with a private van the first time that your car broke down. That is incorrect. The private van was provided to bring my children to school in the morning, and then it was not able to bring the children home until after 3.45, and I was told by Ms. Miller that the children could not remain at Can the school. And I, I, you had a, a good time. amount of time to explain your side. I'd like to be able to speak without being interrupted. All right, we're in a meeting, it's appropriate, and I'll give you time to respond afterwards. Thank you. You were given a, a van above and beyond, something that we wouldn't have done for anybody else to be kind, to be helpful. We had a van that was going back and forth that was serving a special needs student, so it was passing anyway. So to help you out for a few weeks while your car was being repaired, we provided that service to you. You were dishonest with us about the state of your car. It was confirmed with your husband when I spoke with him. He said it had been repaired a long time prior to. I have it in writing. Um, outside of that, we went up. Um, Danny spent probably about 10 hours of his time driving the area. He also spoke with the Department of um, Transportation at the AOE. We have an AOE trainer for safety who is actually on our staff who also took a look. Um, at the site up there, and it is not safe for a 40-foot, 14,000-pound bus to travel those routes, especially in the wintertime. We also spoke with the select board, met in my office, and with the uh, road foreman, and he was very clear that it was not safe and that those roads would not be ready, and they were already stretched to their limits in terms of doing that, that work. Um, furthermore, to his memory, and his memory, he said, goes back 30 years, there have never been bus stops up there. Yes, there was. I checked with my road crew. I'm repeating what, what they've said, and I've got it in my notes. With my road crew, their memory goes back to 2001, and there was not a bus stop up there. Yeah. Not for a full-size bus. We went up. I talked with the select board about you know the possibility of Rolling Rock Road. There's not enough space for the turnaround, and I can show, show you why on the map that Please we drew out. Please do, because there's not enough space, and we've been confirmed to that. Uh, no, you haven't. Yeah. All right, um, let me ask you a question. Again. What's uh, the answer? The what do ans we do? The answer is, is that you have a bus stop that is 1.2 miles away. I agree it is a bit far, and you get it's your long ways for the kids to walk home. They are 7 and 10 years old. You are a parent. You have yes, responsibilities with your children. I am a children. taxpayer. I am a taxpayer as well. If I could pick up every child at the, be at the, the, the foot of their driveway, I'd do I'm that. I'm not asking for that. I'm asking on a public road where there used to be a bus stop. There the did not used to be a bus stop. At the intersection of Rolling Rock Road and Braintree Hill Road, yes, there was. Apparently, you That's Troy Taylor. He lived right there in the A-frame, just past their driveway. The they picked their kids a, up. There the the was Arbuckles. not a bus stop from us there. The and it's not as well. possible for the buses to turn around on that. It is more than you know, possible. We can't, yeah, gonna, this is, this we're is gonna, not a discussion we're gonna that sit can happen argue. in this part of this, uh, this Can meeting? I find out if the mm -hmm. um, information, all the correspondence that I did send prior, if that could be please reviewed, because apparently there is definite miscommunication. And the fact that I was dishonest is completely inaccurate. My husband has been away at work, not here in okay. this area. Thank you. Um, I appreciate your concern. It's, you know, and it's something we'll definitely revisit as a board. Um, we'll make sure that we do have all the correspondence. If you want to be on the agenda for the next meeting. Absolutely. Okay. Um, does that need to be in writing? It should be. Should be in writing. Okay. And who do I send that to? Because I was told that I cannot contact the board directly. You can email it to me, and Linda? we'll make sure it gets yep. on the agenda. So, and how do you want it worded so that I make sure? Just it is say you want to be on the agenda for for a busing issue or bus okay. bus issue. Okay, and can, we can and revisit the date it the then. January meeting, please. 
uh, second Monday of January. Yeah. We're just looking for an answer and a solution to something. Mm -hmm. You know, 1.2 miles is a long ways for those two little kids at seven and nine years old to walk across the lake on top of Braintree Hill. A lot of strange people that ride that road, mm -hmm. okay? We don't know. It's a risk to take with it with and my it grandkids risk, and, and her kids to walk that, that far. It is a the meeting is, house, that would be possible. Mm -hmm. It is a risk to send a bus on those roads. You've had three people look at this independently and determine that, including a safety officer. So I'm sorry that we don't agree, um, but we've made every effort that we could to accommodate the request. It is not safe, and I will not put students at risk. I won't either. There's, there's a, there also is no precedent, you know, there are lots of people who don't live on bus routes, and it really Absolutely. is, you know, throughout this district. And so I completely um, understand we are that. Far but my flung. problem is, is it was an existing bus stop. Why can't it be reactivated? Well, we need to look into that mm -hmm. and make sure. And see, as I see said, there's what the history family. is. And, yep. Okay. Thank you. All right. Anyone Thank else? You. Thank you. Um, first of all, we'd like to give uh, credit where credit is due. That's always good. Um, we'd like to applaud the current maintenance directors, Wes Gibbs and Bob Worley, for a um, um, job well done, basically. After several years of asking athletic directors, coaches, teachers, principals, a superintendent, and the former maintenance director, um, these two gentlemen took, took it upon themselves to actually take care of some issues that had been going on for years, and not only ourselves, Jessica and myself, but other parents and taxpayers and community members had asked for stuff to be done, and these gentlemen um, were asked about it once. We didn't ask them to do it, we asked them about it, and it was taken care of. So we wanted to thank um, Wes Gibbs and Bob Worley for actually doing the job that they were hired to do for the public good. And. Uh, to that, we'll go on to the next thing. If you just want to take one of those and hand it around, I'm sure everybody can take a look at that. So, I just handed out a definition of the word boy to you folks. And looking at the word boy, I have to ask you, is there any reason why a um, seventh grade student okay, would be threatened with detention, a double detention, or a week's in-school suspension if he was caught using this word within the school confines? Seems pretty unreasonable to us. Um, I'm here before you because I spoke with his parents directly and um, their feeling is that their child may have another five years at this school and they're trying to choose their battles and asked that, or I asked them if I could speak about this for them and they said yes. So allegedly under the direction of Principal T. Elijah Hawks, a guidance counselor did exactly that pulled this individual into their office and threatened him with detention or in-school suspension if he was caught using the word boy again within the school confines. Um, this is not an allegation. This is direct from the student. This actually happened. So was this targeting a, a student of color? Was this a black student? Because it was not. This, this individual, um, I know him. He's very jovial. He's... Um, He's outspoken, outgoing, um, and he goes up to his friends and says, hey boy, what's going on boy, what you doing boy? So apparently the principal is taken upon himself to make everything a racist comment or everybody's racist, it's not acceptable. Um, and so that's all I'm gonna say about that, but I would implore the the, the appropriate course of action is would you act mind Would you mind if I finish speaking first? I'm or? trying to help you out because you're about to ask and for me. The appropriate course of action is to actually bring it directly to me so I can investigate. Okay. And well, I think it should be brought out in the public yep. also. So that being said, this same individual happens to be colorblind. 
and I don't know if any of you are familiar with color blindness, but they have special glasses nowadays that you can get. And a um, family friend bought this, this child a pair of glasses that are over $600 to better the student's life and, you know, better his education. He was told he could not wear them in school because the teachers and faculty could not see his eyes. Okay? This, to me, is discrimination. Okay? It's taking away from the student's educational experience by not allowing him to wear them and see what he should be able to see. So I believe he's being singled out because his political views are far different from the current principal, and um, he's being treated unfairly. So... Um, I guess, you know, other than that, we continue to see that this principal, T. Elijah Hawks, is continuing to push his own political and social agendas in this public school, and we believe it's wrong. So we would like it looked into fully. Thank you. And ask for his resignation, or ask the superintendent to ask for his resignation. Anything else? No. Thank you. So can we follow up? Because I'd like to get the information and just take a look and see what. Sure, absolutely. Yeah, you can reach me. Uh, what's the best best way to contact you? 802 775 5500. Thank you. You're welcome. Anything else? Uh, yeah, I have one thing. I feel a little unprepared. Everyone came with notes. <laughs> and you know, I speak off the cuff here. Um, it's my understanding you guys are currently working on next year's schedule. Uh, in that vein, I wanted to bring up, I guess, concerns that I have. Um, first, it, I wanted to point out my review of the schedule, and I could be wrong, and someone's willing, you know, more than happy to correct me. Uh, it seems that there are 17 weeks of school, 18 weeks of school in the first semester, and only seven of those are full weeks. Um, I don't know why that schedule is such, but it's a bit concerning to me, and it concerns me for basically three reasons. One is, as I understand it, one of the stated goals of the school is to provide safe harbor for children in the community that are suffering trauma outside of school. Uh, having them out of school more than 62% of the time seems opposed to that goal of giving them a safe space. Uh, the second would be that in a community like ours where being at work is a premium and there's a dearth of childcare, not providing a consistent school experience for those children and somewhere they can be every day, puts a burden on people that are working hard in any way and, and are having trouble finding child care. Um, and then, I guess, just of my own views, and I don't know, I'm not an educator, I, I'm not trained in it, but it seems to me that at least part of the educational experience is repetition and rote and rhythm. And when you break a child's school experience and consistently consistency that many times over the course of 17 weeks, it it doesn't further them in the educational process, but I could be wrong. That's all I wanted to say. Thanks very much. That's not something we typically are made aware of, but that's something you know we should definitely look into. Thanks. I think you're correct about the calendar. I don't know if I can talk. To yeah. I don't know if you know that Frenchie and Brookfield do operate a program on the half days for the rest of the day. It's not right. they're not with your teacher. Right. Um, but there is a program operating for preschoolers and K-6 kids. Right. The Randolph Rec program also operates a program for Rec for Randolph kids. And you can, you can, the way I, the way I remember the calendar, and this is, you know, what I see in my head from looking at it in the past, there are three half days, so that still only accounts for ten and leaves seven weeks where there's either a vacation or one day completely out of school. Wow. So that's 42 percent of your time where you don't have a full week, which means your children are going two days day off, two days, three right. days off, four days, four days off, and so on and so forth. And it doesn't, I don't know, I could be wrong, but if one of the complaints of the school year is that summers are too long and they lose ground when they're not at school, then you're obviously losing ground a lot in your first semester. But that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Our next order of business is Sorry about the concert on the same night. I can take full responsibility for that. We didn't look at when the board meetings were. And, uh, uh, we will do better at that next time. <laughs> and if there's been room, you can.
could have joined us, but it was clearly, uh, we've never done a preschool since third grade concert. Maybe we'll split that in half next year. I don't know, we'll think about that a lot. A lot of people are going to do uh, So, but it, it's good to, to have it be popular, I guess. So. The other grade their first concert. Everybody, everybody, everybody has to come. Everybody has to come. Grandma and grandpa and neighbors and grandparents <laughs> and everything. It's true. So, sorry about that. And Erica apologizes for not being here. She's homesick. She is homesick. You wouldn't want to do today, so. <laughs> So, so we're here to talk to you really about Track My Progress, but we want to give you just a little bit of, of background information before we jump right into that. So um, we've spent some time now creating a guaranteed curriculum, and you've seen some of this stuff before. This is the work that we've been doing for years, and you know, when, uh, uh, unpacking the standards and identifying the high leverage standards um, in literacy and math. And we've incorporated these standards into the different units and really have a curriculum in place that is followed in all of the elementary schools. Um, we've worked hard over the last two years creating the common formative assessments that the teachers use on a regular basis to formatively check, okay, did the kids get this standard or not? And if they didn't get it, now what am I going to do? Or in fact, they form groups, they are able to get back and deal with them because they want the children to move forward having the information that they're supposed to have. They teach it and then they'll do it once again. Is it the exact same CSA that the common form says before, or one just a different couple of different words? They're basically testing the same thing. We have a lot of different ways that we are tracking our students, and they take different, different amounts of time, and they're a little bit double check on each other, and some are only used at different grades of TS goals in preschool, and the PNOA is, is for the K-1-2s, and there's a new ENOA that was just starting to use this year for third graders. And we, we take all of that is this information and use it to not only inform our curriculum, but to really inform our instruction, make sure that we are getting the kids, students what they need. It's also important because sometimes we all have bad days. Somebody may bomb one of the assessments, and like with Track My Progress, you can't repeat it once they do it once. It's they're done until the next time when we do it. So it's great that if they did bomb, we have several other assessments to look at. And like, eh, they must have just had a bad day, or they're a little, the little ones are a little too impulsive, and they click on the answer, something, click on an answer really quickly without really looking at what it is. So Track My Progress, we started well, we piloted it uh, two years ago and started using it with everybody three through six. Uh, last year, and um, it's administered four times a year in what grades one and two, and three times a year for grades three through six. Um, it's a fun test because it's adaptive, so it's not it's not everybody sees the same problems, and and you can see we'll show you um, a couple of places where we're going to show you how what the results look like to a teacher, um, how the test says oh, you didn't get that, and then they back them down to a slightly easier standard, trying to find where the weakness is um, in their work. And, and it can be done with everybody at the same time, and it's work that would take a teacher, you know, 45 minutes each student. And, and we were doing that a little bit with our Fontes and Pinnell and, and, and other work, and, and this has allowed us to spend a little bit less time assessing students and a little bit, and then when it shows a weakness, then we can go back in and take one of those other assessments and find out more information. And it's on the computer, hence the reason why sometimes they're a little bit impulsive, because they're just used to playing games, I think, on the computer. Um, we tried it in a little bit at the end of kindergarten last year, and those kids were just too young, so we, we decided not to use it at the kindergarten level this year. So after taking the test, we did split into um, math, the top part, and ELA. Um, this is a student who's doing really well with the standards. Um, and if you're used to, you, this only matters if you've looked at our, our color things before. This is, um, uh, track my progress is order of red, yellow, blue, green. Uh, we used to have one, but it went green, blue. And so we have trouble wrapping our heads around it every time we're back in the sun. <laughs> oh no, there's so much, but, 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 but it's I better. But I low to high, tell them. Right, and so anyway, um, this is, this is uh, a student who's doing pretty well and a student that we might take a look at th their weaknesses and, and, and see if they can be strengthened. Or we might say, oh, here are some things that they're doing really well and give them some uh, ex extended learning opportunities. 
um, here's a student not doing as well, and so is more likely to spend um, time with an interventionist getting e extra assistance in weaknesses. And again, not all of them all at the same time. Um, take a look at relative weaknesses and what the new learning is and what can be um, uh, most easily um, accessed by the student. And uh, But this student highly likely to be getting intervention in both math and literacy. And the teacher can, uh, you'll see in a couple slides, like that foundational is red. The teacher can know, can look and see exactly which standards that is and then know that, oh, i got to really pound that a little bit more and spend some more time on that versus maybe some of the blue areas where they're actually meeting standard goals. So um, here's a year-long report um, for a student of, uh, so this is, um, for this year, so summer is um, the one that happened in May, late May, early June. And so, so you know the seasons in order, I don't <laughs> tell you that. So, so this, this is a whole year for a student. You can tell it actually for this student, it improved a decent amount if you look across at the same mm -hmm. thing that they're mm -hmm. measuring. Mm -hmm. So those are the standards on the left, and then progress goes across to the right. Exactly. Yeah. Uh -huh. So yeah. I was checking it four different times in the year. And, and these numbers are, yeah, and, and, and here we have the, um, the, the in percentiles, um, and it's, it's one way of taking a look at the scores. Um, here, this is what it looks like um, for an individual student. You see questions 1 through 11, and the questions of domain and how they're going along with easy, 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 okay, we'll give them a medium on, oh no, I've got a hard one, they missed it, so then they jumped them back to a medium, they did it okay, let's try another hard one, up, oh, they missed it, went back to a medium, and then it kind of found out, okay, um, here we're stuck, and then um, all the way down to hard. You can also look at how much time a student spends on a problem, because of course you would like them to spend a lot of time and then be successful, but you're also okay with them spending uh, a lot of time in being unsuccessful. It, it, that's okay because they, they, they persevere. What you don't like to see is, oh, man, 33 seconds, I'm out. I, that's just, you just know it's just too hard then. It's really important to time one. I, we had a second grader here last year who just decided he was going to fool around and click, 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 click. And we could see, you know, five to 10 seconds on your question, and he's on there. <laughs> you know, and I said to his mom, well, here it is. <laughs> uh, he did better at the next time, but he was just fooling around. But that's super helpful because sometimes you're like, no, 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 I tried, I really did. Right. But, you know, let's look. And, and it's also a student who hasn't given up because, you know, yeah. they're spending a good amount of time, and even as the questions go on, still committing you know, four, minutes four minutes and three, three, three minutes and change to on the, on the problems. Um, then we have just a few samples of problems. You can see at the top, so if it's standard, the first number is the grade level, and then um, and tells what you do. So it tells you the, the level and how much time that the student spent in the incorrect answer. And so just a few samples. Um, the teacher can also see which one, if they got it wrong, which answer they chose. And that helps in analyzing the help that they need. Again, here's a, a first grade problem. Um, you know, the zebras have black and white. If you hover, if they hover above the little rectangle there, it will present three words, and then the children need to pick which one is the right answer. Um, and there are also problems. What if they accidentally click the wrong one? Can they go? Can they fix it? So they can. Once they've moved on, they can't because remember it's adaptive. So it's, if, it's making so a choice. So if they oh, accidentally click the wrong one. Until they press OK. Until they move on. Okay. Right. Yeah. But okay. if they move on, they can't go back. Okay. Some okay. problems are timed. And the students don't see that they're timed in the sense that they work on them and they put right or wrong answers. But if they went beyond the time that was allotted for the problem, they don't get credit for it even if it's correct. Because if they spend four four minutes on a problem that they should have answered in 15 seconds. That mm -hmm. it gives, but it gives us information, and then we get to know that also. And nobody's saying, time's up, stop working. Yeah, yeah. yeah. They, they're great, I got it right. So, um, and again, more samples. This is a third grade math problem. Second grade medium literacy. Did they, did they get immediate feedback whether or not it's the right or wrong answer? They do not. They do not. No, the they, teacher, they, they just the teacher, the deal, yeah. the teacher okay. will have the report as okay. soon as they submit done, but the kids not necessarily, the older kids we show pretty quickly. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah. But not, but not, they click on it and you do get it. Yell, they don't yell then, right. Okay. Um, this seems so simple, but there are actually a couple of paragraphs that go with it. They actually have to do a little bit of reading before they can choose a sentence that actually um, answers the question. Uh, this is a third grade um, literacy problem. Um, back to first grade, math, sixth grade, math, medium, sixth grade, medium. And this is hard. Choose an answer that does not match the tone of the paragraph. That's, that's pretty yeah. difficult. I mean, it's not like it's first grade, but still, I think it's pretty difficult to do. So they have space to figure things out too. Yeah, they can yeah absolutely. Yeah, blank paper and mm -hmm. pencil. Yeah. yeah. This just shows a, a report that the teachers can see for percentile. You see the green percent down below. We mostly look at the scale score, which is the upper right blue line right there. Um, when they come in in the fall, it looks like they're going down, but that also shows the same thing up there. And that's just because when they come in and you change a grade, now it's so say they're going from second to third grade. Now it's third grade standards. And so they should go down <laughs> uh, when they first come in. It's not tested at the end of the year third grade standards, but it's the beginning of the year third grade standards, which we haven't taught yet. So we more look at the scale score, which averages all that, and that looks decent. Right. And we can also go in and take take all the standards listed down inside for, for a given student mm -hmm. and look at their scale scores to see if they're, if, you know, maybe their whole score in math went up, but when we look at the scale score, they could have still gone down in a couple if they've improved. And what we want is, steady improvement on those. It's really important. And if they go backwards, oh, we want to figure out why as quickly as we can. So teachers obviously look at that data. We've talked about that before. CFAs are common formative assessments. Based on that, we have intervention groups. I know in Braintree we sit down um, as a team every Monday at 11.30. And um, we talk about that. We look today. They're just finishing up the winter assessment right now, so we don't have those results for you because it's the testing window still. But we are already like in there. And you can see the teachers looking at it. And look at this one and look at this one. And if they go up or down or how they do. Um, we have, um, we'll meet next week and look at all that. And we have intervention groups here um, for a half an hour in the afternoon. And we will change up those groups depending on how they did for the track my progress. So they're constantly looking at those and at CFAs on a to repeat, repeat or do differently their instruction so the kids can pass them. Um, and our NCSS leadership team, which meets, mm, depending on whether we get any canceled after school meetings with snow, every month or every other month. Um, and look at that to help decide our district goals for elementary schools and where we want to focus on. And as you know, math was the, one of the areas we focused on for this year. Right. And what? we've also used it to help steer our professional development. We've had different people come in and say, here's a weakness in math. Mm -hmm. We have someone come in and help us with problem solving. Or work, but that was the most recent thing that we did. So that's worked for well. That was just the last Thursday. Exactly. We had a whole day exactly. of problem solving because that was an SPEC where we were following mm -hmm. down the most was problem and, solving. And last year it was, we had um, another specialist come in and deal with intervention and work with all of our interventionists and special mm -hmm. educators. Mm -hmm. so. Remind us what MTSS stands for. Well, Multi tiered system of support. Was uh, program put in so that um, as students are identified as having weaknesses or, or needing help, the first step wasn't to go immediately to special education services, that there are things that every district is supposed to have in place to try to remediate before you get to that step. And we have, um, I don't know how many, 20, 22 people on that team. It's from all three mm -hmm. elementary schools. A representation from every grade, every intervention says guidance principles mm -hmm. are all there. So it's quite an eclectic team. Um, and if, if uh, we have to decide whether we're getting better, there's all these measures we kind of look at and, and we decide together, are all three schools moving forward? Have we all made progress in this area? And if only two have and not one, we can't, we have to, do, we're as a team, we're unusual <coughs> in this district, as you know, so if one of them is like, eh, you know, if I'm not found in Braintree, like, I haven't figured that one out yet in Braintree, you know, we would all go up together and see, help me figure it out, if that's the problem. Right. And we have our math coach, our literacy coach, and then our State systemic improvement plan um, mm -hmm. person comes and works with us on it too. Yeah, they're part of the team. They come to the meetings. Mm -hmm. Okay. Does, does we have questions? Are you at the point where you can say at the start of the year, this is where we want the the students to be by the end of the year? 
Because part of what we're trying to do is, as a board, is we kind of need to be looking at what are our outcomes, and we need to know from you all what are some realist. So, what are your benchmark goals for where students are going to be as they move through the year? So, do you are you familiar enough with this data now to say? Okay, when we start out with the first grade, by the end of the end of the year, we want 70% to be in the blue or the I forget what colors they were, blue or the green. Um, and do, does this tool give you sort of realistic when you take sort of the average first grader what to expect at the end um, in terms of outcomes? We did set what we call week goals, one of the important goals at the beginning of the year with staff that are products and service based. Um, and so we're trying to have every child go up 10% in math. And we are monitoring that in every school in different ways. Teams are doing it differently, which we want them to figure out how they want to monitor that. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's something where, you know, once you set a goal, then it's like, okay, well, if we're going to get here, what's this month, what's our goal, mm -hmm. what's this month and this month? And so that's the work that, uh, that all the teachers are doing in all three schools so that we can bring math up by at least 10% for every child. I mean, the high kids sometimes there's not as that much wiggle room, but everybody else, there's more wiggle room to do that. Mm -hmm. um, and that's part of the reason why analyzing all that data is so important, because if somebody isn't getting there, and that's the meeting next Monday for Braintree that we have, is let's look at everybody individually now, and who's not, you know, by about now, I think we made it by March, our goal was uh, for young ones at least to be 5% and be 10 by the end of the year, because this, this actually isn't halfway through the year, as you know. Mm -hmm. um, so we want to have N5 here when most of the year is still yet to come. Right. So, but if we're having a child that didn't go up at all, or only up 1%, then, then we'd be concerned, we'd look at this intervention group and figure out what to do for that child. So I don't know if that answers a little bit of your question. Mm -hmm. So they're, they're driving for an overall goal. The, the Track My Progress translates very well to how the students perform on SBAC. Um, it was one of the reasons when the team sat down to, de to decide on Track My Progress um, that they picked this particular tool. The overall goal for the, the district is, you know, 50% um, above proficiency, you know, as a minimum 70% is kind of the ideal given resources at this point in time. Um, and this is a, a tool to help help folks drive things in that direction. And we, when we looked at track at the beginning when we started using it, we needed to adjust their thresholds because they actually weren't high enough to match SBAC thresholds, so we raised them from where they had them so that they wouldn't match. So that we would know it should pretty well things that match both the, the outcomes. We don't want to be surprised. Yeah, yeah. We don't want to, we don't want to make it look great and then it's like, they know it's not right, so great. Right. So we needed to be the same, so we adjusted that. And we have a, you know, you can do that in person. And as professional educator leaders, do you feel like this is a, a good assessment tool? And do you feel like we're doing the right things by children? Are we too heavily assessing? Are they feeling, are the kids like, oh God, here we go again. You're making me sit at this computer and do this thing, or? So this is, this is, this is not a waste of time assessment. It, it actually is a really good use of time because it doesn't, doesn't take a lot of time mm -hmm. from the kids. It takes less time than the things we used to do by hand, it's right? Really and, and it gives us really quick feedback, and mm -hmm. it's really good feedback. It's better than we could do all by right. ourselves. We also, I think we reported to you last year, we were um, we had a lot of assessments, but we needed to see how this one was before we dropped any others. So we mm -hmm. have done some of them less often this year in order mm -hmm. to help teachers so we're not and kids, so we're not assessing so much all the time. But it's really important that we don't just, as I said earlier, judge on one assessment. This is one. But if you get a trigger happy little kid, you know, this might look poorly. Um, and we want other measures to say, yeah, I don't know what happened that day, but other days they, they're fine. They're showing evidence in their CFAs and, and whatever else that they're doing really well. Mm -hmm. What's a CFA? Common formative assessments. Oh. They're, they're local assessments Those that are they created that align with the standards okay. that are being taught. That they do pretty often, yeah. Sometimes it's one problem, though. It's not like there's pages of it. So mm -hmm. Those are quick. Those are yeah. almost exit ticket kind of problems. Five minutes, ten minutes at the end mm -hmm. of class. You know, we're gonna, Just you know, to the see. Teacher can look at them later yeah. and know what we're doing tomorrow. Is, mm -hmm. Did we actually get it? So can we move on? Mm -hmm. I don't know if the kids, at least the young ones, see this as a test anyway. It's on the computer. They kind of like being on the computers. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs>
Um, we have found that for some kids, testing in a small group is better than if you're monitoring 20 in the second grade class. Sometimes we, we make sure we supply extra adults when we know they're doing that assessment mm -hmm. um, so that we can really monitor, like, slow down, take your times, no hurry, that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. Are there any other questions? Thank you. Thank you. David, I'm happy to see if you can flip over to the other. It's, it's a map. I apologize. It wasn't like the Windows machine was right. Can you do the Mac users here and how to access a thumb drive off an iPad? Oh, I don't have it right. Yeah. 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 I'm going to apologize for being a little pesky today. I've been running a fever of 102 for the last two days. But no, but I'm, I'm, just, I'm wanted to be here because it's the budget presentation, which is vital. Kind of watch. Ah, there you go. Actually, click on that. Uh, the open forum one about four point four down. Uh, no, 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 it's not the one I wanted. I know I brought it over. And yeah. Yeah. And no, it's got yeah. the Yeah, let me Is it in a folder? <laughs> kick, kick, the, uh, yeah. kick the drive out, and I'll just I'll make sure I'm loaded up. Let me load it off my other computer, make sure it's on there. One of those days. But it's funny, it's like the open forums I've been sticking with uh, high school for a lot of them because I know I can get the technology to work. Oh. I'm ask for about two minutes just to copy the we'll file. They're beautiful machines. They just they don't have the functionality. I know. The problem with the Windows is. The dongles we have don't always work. I had to do it. Where did those Yeah. Can you get a moment here? Sure. Thank you. There we go. Me too. I'm going to see a little Corolla. I tried to squeeze it in. Oh, you're over that side. You can see that I can get bumped to buy somebody else. I was a little shocked. I was like, oh man, is there some big issue that I wasn't aware of? People are up and over. I was well practiced at 5 30, running home, and then running right back down. Yes, it's a long way. Do you have any kids that are doing three sports at the same time? So, uh, the third one is uh, <laughs> the budget. I like the branches. Yeah, just the opposite. 25 minutes to get over here. Yeah. Actually, go to the other side. Actually, go to the Then I get home and he's still talking. So, I'll simply go to the other side. But you need to shut that down. He's talking, no problem. That's good. He's talking. Exactly. That would be nice. Yeah. Okay. Okay. 
Actually, is not the budget presentation. It's the quarterly facilities monitoring report. I mean, as far as the agenda goes. Yeah. And there should be an updated uh, yeah, copy that came around. It's got a little color in it. Yeah. Um, I thought a great job. And that includes kind of the direct inspection signatures that are on there. Um, Thanks. There's a couple that I'll I'll kind of point out. Um, the second one down, um, needed HVAC repairs throughout district. Um, that 25,669.08, I want to point this out for a special reason here. Um, this is basically the solder, the pipes, the elbows, and everything else that has been required um, for use by our new HVAC person to do the work that he is doing around the school. So if he is spending $25,000 um, or more on basic supplies, you can imagine how much work is happening um, across the district. Uh, they are swapping out the, the hot water heaters and the hot water storage tanks. Um, they are going through, they are fixing um, a lot of the leaks that were there. Um, it was interesting when the uh, town put in a new meter um, for the district to measure the water use because the old one wasn't working the way that it should. We were having about $9,000 a week every couple of months. Um, mm -hmm. So they were able to track that down. He's been able to do those repairs. Um, the other thing that he has done is he is separating the high school and the tech center into sections so that if you have to do work in one area, you don't have to shut the water down to the entire building to do work in that area. Um, so there's a significant amount of, of, of progress. And it's not just the basic plumbing. Um, there's a lot of forced wa hot water. Um, so there's a tremendous amount of work that he's doing in terms of trying to get the, the heating systems um, up and into place. Um, Raven Project, I'm throwing that up there. They have spent about 190000 of the three hundred and fifty that the board had approved so far. Um, there's still a little bit more work to do. Um, it's, it's almost complete. The major thing that they have left, and the reason that that's still kind of sitting there a little bit in progress, um, is because that building is a little bit noisy in the workshop area. Right? It's got uh, metal walls um, with insulation sandwiched between two sheets of, of sheet steel. Um, so the sound tends to bounce around a little bit. So the last thing that they'll be doing in there before this is done is they've got an engineer coming in to try to put in some acoustical tiles to, tie, to deaden the sound down to a safe level for the kids. Um, paving, loading dock, repair work, that's going to be going out for bid uh, very shortly. Um, that was the one where the, the leader really misquoted. Uh, they did a miscalculation in terms of the tar. Um, that would be used for that. So the board had actually approved money for that last year. Their quote came in 70000 above what we were expecting. So at that point in time, I said, no, um, we'll put it back out to bid um, next year, um, see if we can get some better bids on it. Um, plus, I wasn't too happy they weren't willing to work with us after the, after the mistake that they made. Um, there's still a considerable amount of work that is happening at RES. Um, there are a lot of parts and pieces in the heating system and the cooling system that is over there um, that have worn out due to lack of maintenance. Um, so they are replacing what needs to be replaced and they are making sure that the maintenance is happening on an accelerated rate until it's caught up to where it should be. Uh, da, da, da. The Alice training, I just wanted to point that out. Um, that is annual uh, every fall, especially when the new teachers come in. Um, Wes and Bob uh, hold a, a, a dedicated training for the new teachers so that all the teachers in the district uh, continue to be Alice, Alice trained. Um, and then the roof replacement. Um, they are in the process of gathering quotes. Um, there is close to $4 million in the reserve account um, at this point in time. The quote to replace the roof, at least the general one that we've got, just people kind of eyeballing it, um, um, not the, the specific ones that will be coming, um, is about $1.8 million. Now that includes a replacement of the entire roof plus all the mechanicals that are on top. Um, so usually 
you know, any kind of air conditioning, air circulators, um, heating elements that are up there, they're typically good for 20 years as well, um, which is the average uh, lifespan of a roof. And when's this going to be done? Uh, as soon as we get those 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 bids in and you guys approve us taking the, the, the money out, we may try to go after it this summer um, to get it done. They do have some leaks there. It's not bad. Um, so they go up and, and, and repair at, at will at this point in time. Uh, but it is, is reaching the end of its useful life. Um, as part of that discussion, um, they are going to get a separate bid um, just to see what it would be, uh, what it would cost to put a, a solar array up there um, that would... Uh, serve as much of the district as possible. We max out on the size of a solar array that we can put up, we can put up um, to serve the district, um, but I think it would cover about 60% of the entire electrical use of the district as a whole. Um, so we want to get that cost in and just see if it's, if it's reasonable given you know, what the return on investment is going to be for it. Uh, so the roof is 18 years old right now, and it's rated for 25. Do they feel uh, 20, like usually, oh, it basically. says and is rated for 25? No, mm -hmm. they're usually 20. I'll, I'll double check with them. But okay. Yeah. Because it, it sounds like they're feeling like they need to keep get moving on it. Yeah. And I'm just curious. So they cut down the trees that were in front of the... Yeah. They're, and they're, now they're putting new ones. The, the, the like, disease, okay. they were afraid they'd be coming down. Oh, um, oh they were sick. Yeah, oh, okay. especially in and around the parking lot there. Um, they actually felt felt bad about having to take them down because uh, at least the one that was... Well, I was glad to see they put new trees up because when they yeah. took them down, I was like, oh, my God. Yep. But, but I didn't know they were diseased. Yeah, they, they were diseased. There was the concern that they'd be coming down. They also did a little bit of work. Um, the gentleman... Um, Trying to think about the best way to describe it. If you think about the entrance uh, that goes in right by the auditorium, mm -hmm. there's that hill there, the property there. It's yeah. a, it's an apartment building. Um, gentleman in town owns. Um, when they came in, they were cleaning up uh, the trees and stuff around all the areas where our cars drive. Well, they cut way up his hill. Didn't realize they were off the property when the, the group was out there. So some of the trees were to try to replace um, some of the, what we took down so they could get their privacy back. Um, the trees that they bought were high quality for him, but they're short. They'll take a little while to grow. Um, so I think what I may do is have them go out to try to make things right, you know, one, one, one last attempt and, and uh, put some poplars out there, which typically grow, you know, anywhere from six to eight feet a year, um, just to try to get a privacy screen for them uh, at this point in time. But that was part of that work as well, F fixing, fixing what we, what we kind of messed up. Wait, but why wouldn't you just put, like, shrubbery or something? There's a, a tenant that's up on the second floor oh, who used yeah. to like the privacy. And even though it was a lot of just shrub trees um, that were there at the time, uh, you know, she wants the privacy back. Right. Um, so the poplars are nice and tall and they grow really quick. Yeah. Right. <laughs> so, but they might fall down. How much of this is um, out of the budget and how much is going to be? You said the roof will be out of the facilities reserve. So the, the only things on there that have touched the reserve um, will be the roof eventually, mm -hmm. and then the Raven. Raven. Yeah, we haven't touched much uh, of okay. the reserve okay. funds at all, over the, actually over the course of the last three years. Any other questions about the facilities report? Okay, thanks Lane. Um, next is the budget update. Right, so this one, uh, give me a minute to orient myself here. So a lot of kind of work that's been happening kind of last minute, um, scrambling around because of the impact of the new health care negotiations, which we'll talk about up front. Um, those, at least the impact on us, it may not be true of every district, the impact is quite dramatic. Um, and so we'll talk about the details, we'll talk about the numbers, numbers, but it has forced us to kind of rethink just about everything um, that we were planning to do over the next couple of years. Um, but we'll start out where people had kind of asked uh, to start um, at the end of last meeting. Um, I think Ann had mentioned, you know, can we take a look at what, you know, district, district enrollments. And so if we go back the, over the last four years, this is the enrollment trend um, that has been happening. Again, we got relatively s small grades, right? We're not a giant school, mm -hmm. so when one grade goes out and another comes in, there can be a lot of jumping up and down. 
but the basic trend line is up, and on average we're gaining about eight or nine kids per year over the last four years. Yeah. So what's our total number? What's our our total, number total number is probably around 844. For the entire district? Entire district. Wow. Not including preschool. Yeah. If we throw the pre preschool in there, the, the numbers go up. But we only get a, a, a small percentage of them there as far as money, right? Yeah, like so like um, any student that comes in, they actually adjusted, they, we just, we're just starting to get some of the state numbers that we need. Any student that came in last year was worth 10300 in terms of the state portion of the funding. And then anything, anything above that that we were paying for a kid came out of local, it's ten six this year per student. If a student is coming from school choice, we get closer to sixteen to seventeen thousand. And a preschooler, we get thirty-three hundred. Okay, so about a third of a. And that's one of the things when we talk about, you know, future of the preschool plan. You know, where we wanted it to go is the what, what I'm going to propose for next year. One of the things that we want to talk about is the idea that the state um, recognizes that there's a need for early ed. It recognizes the need for preschool, it recognizes the need for daycare, um, but they haven't changed anything legislatively to help folks out. So like if we went into a uh, full day free preschool for four-year-olds, we're not getting any more benefit for having them here all day as we do for the 10 hours at this point in time. So they need to change some things legislatively um, if they want to make this um, palatable to, to districts around the state, if that makes a little bit of sense. Um, your two big growers right now, um, Braintree, right? So Braintree School, this school right here is pushing 100. We were hoping they would cross the line. They're sitting right around anywhere between 97 and 99. Um, we're hoping they cross the line to 100, um, which, will, which will be exciting. We'll have a big, big party when they do. But this school alone has been going up um, six or seven kids per year. Um, and what's neat about this, again, um, extrapolating is kind of tough. But whenever you see data, and the data points are like right on the trend line, that's usually a pretty good indication that things are going to continue in that vein for a while. It's not a guarantee, but usually when the, you don't get a lot of scatter, it means we're going to keep going in that direction. And you've got Brookfield as well. Right? They're growing. They're going to continue to grow for a little while, at least based upon what the, what the data is telling us, that those data points are very close to the trend line. One of the things that I do want to point out, uh, I've got to explain this graph a little bit and hopefully I do it well so that it makes sense. So this is uh, the size of the elementary grades right here and now this year. This actually isn't first grade, this is kindergarten. Kindergarten, first, second, third, fourth, fifth. Our enrollments actually aren't going down, they're going up, right? Mm -hmm. Because what happens is these classes move this way, this class moves up. So you see over the, the last couple of years, right, as time is going on, our enrollments are going up at the elementary level. It'll be another year or two, and that will fall over into the high school level, and the high school will start to increase because of that, um, outside of the fact that it's increased because of school choice. Um, so we do have a pretty good trend kind of going on here in terms of uh, enrollment increase, and keep our fingers crossed that that is going to continue. Um, folks had asked, and I apologize this isn't a little bigger but I can read some of the numbers off here I can I can drop this in your uh, your Google folders that you now have which we can talk about at the end um, this is taking a look back at what the budget was and the population was back to 2016 um, things get a little complicated in 2016 and before because remember you guys were separate districts mm -hmm. right and so everything was kind of calculated separately and kind of brought together um, in some cases the same dollar amounts were showing up on budgets from, so uh, it was a little bit hard to pull out. But in 2016, we um, had 831 students, budget was 15, 15, 4 million. 2017, had 802 students, so the student population in the district had gone down by 3.6%, but the budget went up by 5.8%, okay, to 16 million three. 2018, um, Right, population went up by 6.4% budget, so this was my first budget, went up by 2.1%. Last year, we asked for a huge increase, um, and that was to try to get programs in place to start mitigating the impact 
um, that the students of trauma and the, and the students with emotional disturbances were having in terms of special ed to get some programming in place. So the overall population again jumps up and down at the, at the district level is 832. So the population went down about 2%, about 2.5, and we got an 11.2% increase from the community um, to really kind of help us out, you know, be able to develop the, the preschools, we put the preschools in place, we got the therapeutic program up, we got some more special education teachers that were desperately needed, um, and so it's, it's, it's had a dramatic impact that's going to be paying dividends um, as we go along. So just to answer some questions that came up at the, the last board meeting. Questions on any of this or thoughts? Or? Like I said, I, uh, running that fever, some of it groggy and out of it. So <laughs> if I'm not making sense, tell me. And if there's questions, don't let me gloss over anything that may be important. Okay. Did you get your flu shot? What's that? Did you get your flu shot? Like, shot? I don't know what it is. I don't have any aches and pains. I mean, I got a little bit of a cough and whatnot, but it's just been weird. Um, so the impact of healthcare negotiations. As most uh, folks know at this point in time, um, people have been worried about the double digit increase to health care every year. Um, so a few years ago, um, the governor, I believe a part of the legislature, um, left things up in the last round of negotiations, left things up to the districts and said, what we really want you to do is when you go into negotiations, we want you to try to get um, how much each side is paying to 80-20, having the districts pay 80%, having the teachers pay 20% of their, their health care premiums. Um, some districts did that, a lot didn't. We weren't able to pull that off during negotiations. So to try to get to that goal, um, they put in legislation that allowed for statewide bargaining. So you have the union at the state level negotiating with the Vermont School Board at the state level to come up with a health care plan for the entire state and every teacher, administrator, um, support staff person in it. Now, the whole goal of all this was actually to cut costs. And we're going to talk in a little bit of detail before we jump back into the budget and what we're attempting to do next year um, based upon those costs. Tax commissioner's forecast. So this is recent in Vermont Digger a few days ago. Um, school taxes will rise over 6%. Why? Because of health care. The problem with the article um, that you're going to see when we talk about specifically what's happened in the OSSD is they're right. It is going up 6% and most of that's because of health care. But it's not because of the double digit increases. Um, you know, typically it's about a, a 12 to 14 percent increase every year that we're, we're paying for health care. It's because of the negotiations and some of the things that they agreed upon. Okay. Key driver of the expected rise in spending is health care. Um, there was, depending upon you know what plan you were looking at. Um, in the health plans, the increases were between 12.9% and 14.7% um, this year. Last year, I think they were about 14%. So the health care increases um, from year to year, uh, the premiums that the, the, the insurance companies are charging are quite great. Um, but the biggest impact on this number um, is the impact of state level bargaining. So in other words, it didn't, it didn't bring costs down, it drove them up. To have a statewide in our case, it, it's adding seven hundred and forty thousand to our budget, and I'll, I'll go into the details of that. You know, that dream budget that I was asking for was about half of that seven hundred and forty-four thousand. That was the everything budget, just to try to put stuff in, in, in perspective for folks. Um, so, the piece that's going to kill some districts and not others um, is right here. So, what happened is. There's two proposals that are on the table right now, and as expected, the two sides couldn't agree. And when they get to a certain point and you can't agree, they end up going through fact-finding, which they did, and then they go to arbitration. This is binding arbitration. So what has happened now is they, the arbitrator has the best offer from the Vermont School Board and also the Vermont NEA, and is looking through them and is going to decide completely on this one or this one. Well, what was interesting last week is we got enough information out of them to kind of start picking through the details. And there are some areas where they are in agreement. In other words, it doesn't matter which the arbitrator picks, 
it's going to happen because it's in this one and it's in this one too. One of the areas is this right here. Um, this is talking about what coverage is available and to whom. So, Vermont School Board, things are going to remain status quo until 12-31-20, which is the middle of next year, which is the budget year we're currently planning for. Then, all tiers of coverage available to all school employees who meet eligibility requirements. These guys are saying the same thing. All tiers of coverage available to all school employees who meet eligibility requirements. In their case, they're saying, well, if you choose ours, then it's going to start first thing next year, right off, right off the bat, July 1st. Okay? So both, has an, both have an impact on next year's budget, the one that we're planning now. The only difference is, does it start halfway through the year, or does it start at the beginning? Well, why is this important? We have 48 support staff employees who currently can only have single person health care um, coverage under our contract with them, right? So what this is going to do is this is going to allow every, of, every one of them to have a family option. What's the difference in cost between the two? Um, single plan for support staff costs us about 9000 bucks. Family plan for any member, support staff included, is a little over 25000 So we now, if every one of those support staff members switched from the single plan to the family plan, that's our possible liability just on that one part of the agreement alone, over a million bucks. Now, not all employees are going to jump to that family plan. It's highly likely that if they're being covered by a spouse um, for a family plan that they will probably move to the districts because our plans tend to be better than most of what's offered in private industry around here. Second of all, um, some of them don't have a family. They are either a single individual in the household or they're a married couple or, or partners. Um, in that case, that would be a two-person plan. So what we've done as best we can is we've gone through and asked people about what their family situation is to try to gauge, um, you know, if these folks moved over to the family plan, would they move to a family plan? Would they be moving to a double plan? Would they, would they be staying the same? And based on that analysis, we've got a plan for an extra 740000 next year if they choose the union's plan if it starts July 1st. If it starts halfway through the year, right, in December of 2020, we have to plan half of this, so 370000 But either way, we're going to end up paying the, the full 740 because if it starts halfway through the year, it means we got to plan through 370000 for this year, and then the next budget year, we got to increase another 370000 to cover it. That's a lot of money um, for a district this size. Like I said, it's larger than all the huge increases that you know we, we've been talking about. Um, Are we unusual in that we weren't covering that so before, earlier? So I'm going to give you my best reasonable assumption. When I did the comparables for negotiations last year um, and took a look, I think I looked at nine schools. There were two of them that offered family plans. There were seven that weren't. And the two that did were the real expensive districts that could afford it, like Stone. So my guess is, is the impact that this is going to have is that the districts that can least afford it are going to be hit with this. The reason being is because they could least afford it. They probably weren't offering those plans to begin with because they couldn't afford it. The districts that are wealthy were probably already offering family plans anyway because they could. I'm not saying I'm right, just using a little bit of logic um, to try to think my way through it. Um, so I don't know what the calculus was. I did have the opportunity um, after I kind of ground through the numbers and after the last open forum where we talked about this kind of for the first time with folks um, to have a VSBA member 
um, sitting in my office. And it was very clear that I don't think this was intended, mm -hmm. this impact. So I don't think they were aware of it. Mm -hmm. The intent that they had was good in going into the negotiations. It was to cut health care costs. But the impact for a lot of districts is going to be significantly different. different, different. Um, what they said is, oh, we did include language, in, and this is correct, um, they did include language to allow for uh, cost in, in, in lieu of CIL. So in other words, um, you know, if you want to at the, the local level, you can say, okay, you know, um, if we want to have people not take health insurance, then maybe what we do is we build into the, the contract, you know, we'll give you five grand if you don't take health insurance. Um, and to be honest, if we're going to get the health insurance, I'd rather have them have the health insurance. Mm -hmm. I have nothing wrong with folks getting health insurance. Again, it's just it's the way that this came about and the sudden impact that, that it's happened with a month ago before we have to make budget decisions. Um, so again, what we have to do is change what we were thinking about in terms of the budget. I also want to 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 throw this up here because it's going to play a little bit into our negotiation methodology, and it's okay for this to be open. Um, what ended up happening as well, there was an agreement um, over the course of time to take everybody to 80-20. So in other words, of the overall premium um, that's paid for health care for somebody, the districts will be paying 80% of it, the employee will be paying 20% of it. In our case right now, it's an 85-15 split for the teachers. Well. This is going to be really, really important because even that switch from 85-15 to 80-20 isn't going to save any money. It'll be cost neutral. It comes down to the, the foundation, and those of you that were on the negotiating committee may have heard me say this a couple of times last year. Collaborative, right? Collective bargaining is about exchange of value. We as a district provide you as the teachers with something of value, we provide you with pay and with benefits. In exchange, you give us something of value in return, which is the work that you put in on behalf of our kids. And those two things are presumably equal. If one side comes in and tries to change things, then it's reasonable for the other side to say, well, you have to change our piece too to make sure that the values remain equal. Right? So what will happen and should happen, this is, this is reasonable, because if everything else remains the same in terms of what we're requiring the teachers, they should be getting the same pay next year as they're getting this year with a slight cost of living increase. What happens in this scenario is after the switch to 80-20, the teachers are paying 62000 and these are our district's number, $62,000 more for their health care than they were before, and so they're going to expect to see that money where? And their salaries. And their salaries. Mm -hmm. That's the only way we're going to be able to make them whole. That's a reasonable argument. Mm -hmm. That's an appropriate one. So there is no savings for switching from here to here. Potentially for districts that I've seen, like in Massachusetts, that have manipulated this numbers, there is a little bit of a savings down the line. Because they are paying more of their health care, when that double-digit increase hits because the premiums go up, we're not paying as much of that increase, right? Because we're not accountable for as much money overall anymore. Um, but that, that is minimal. So one of the things that I think we need to think about is this idea of being made whole. When we go into negotiations, this is a question I think we're going to have to ask. How does the district keep the value exchange equal now that they just got a $470,000 increase, $740,000 increase, excuse me. And some people pointed out, well, this is support staff. They don't make a lot to begin with, which is true. So we may never recoup any value for this dramatic increase to our budget, at least value that is in direct service of the kids um, because of this change. The other thing that has happened when they made this decision is that they've accelerated the costs for the yearly increase. 
I'm now paying $740,000 more dollars for health care than I now have to pay an additional 13 or 14 percent on each year when health care costs go up. Right? So just on this change alone, it's, not, it's bad enough we gotta, we got to take this, but every year that goes by on the average increases, you just added another 100000 to our bill every year um, because of that 12 percent increase that's going to happen. Yeah, I was, I was, well, again, one of the reasons I'm testy too is because of this, because when the full realization of what it means um, is there, um, it's quite costly. Questions on any of this before we move into budget and adjustments? And kind of sounds like the negotiators didn't have their uh, ducks in a row. No. no. I mean, granted, it's complex. Well, that's why I was wondering whether we were one of the few districts that weren't providing that coverage already. No, no I think I think there's a there's a big awakening. I think our district, you know, that six percent when we go if we go back to the article I, I showed, this alone is probably about a six percent yeah. in that ballpark. So again, the person writing the article is talking about healthcare, but they're not going into the details of where that six percent is coming from either because they didn't dig deep enough or people weren't being forthcoming about it. Um, but there's a huge increase coming across the state because of that negotiation. So I feel bad. I mean, the intent was good, but the impact certainly is not. All right. So based upon this new gigantic increase that we've got to deal with, um, there are winners, there's losers, and there's maybes. The winners are what we're keeping or what I'm going to recommend that we keep. The losers are, you're out of here. You're too expensive. We'd like to do you, but with the, um, the cost that we're going to have to pay for health care, it's just, we can't justify putting the community through it. And then there's maybes. And so that's a part of the discussion tonight as, as we go through this, is I've got my recommendations, um, but the maybes is where I want the board's input. This is, that looks, no, keep. No, still, still too much, um, given the overall picture. Um, losers, middle school, the idea of, of putting in a middle school a model is out for now. Um, it'll be at least two years before we can even revisit it. And that's if numbers uh, justify it at that point in time, and that's if we're able to move forward with the, the preschool um, the way that we want to. That said, you know, those meetings were very good um, because we still have to do something about what we've got in place now and make it better because it's not working. Right now. Show, it shows up in the data. It uh, shows up in context when you talk to folks um, about our EHS. So we had talked about pulling together a planning team, a middle school planning team. Um, I, I talked with the folks that are starting to, 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 to create that, um, and they're still going to meet, but the focus has changed. They're not talking about bringing sixth grade up anymore. They're just looking at seventh and eighth grade. They're going out. They're going to look at the research that's out there. They're going to see some schools around that are doing a really good job, and they're going to bring back ideas on how we can change what we've got. Um, there are two things that are going to happen anyway um, that I'm not taking off the recommendation uh, list, regardless um, of all the other financial impacts from the health care, and that's the socio-emotional socio learning training and implementation that's got to happen at our UHS. Um, one of the reasons that the elementary school is doing pretty well despite the trauma-based behaviors that are going on there um, is because they brought in PBIS a few years back. And that helps mitigate a lot of the low-level behaviors that happen in and around the school that interfere with learning. For whatever reason, four or five years ago when PBIS came in, the high school did not adopt anything that was comparable. PBIS? Uh, the Positive. Behaviorally, yeah. Okay. Um, I just wanted to make yeah. sure. We it's, um, it's, it's a really good model for the elementary kids, right? They get rewards for behaving appropriately to hopefully try to reinforce the behaviors. Right. I'm not sold on it because all the research says that when the rewards go away, the behavior stops. Yeah. Um, but it certainly doesn't work um, at the high school level because the high schoolers are a little bit more sophisticated. They see it as being transactional. They see it as being bribed. Mm -hmm. um, so it can actually reverse things a little bit. Mm -hmm. So a responsive classroom um, is a model that has actually been in this district. Um, it was at the elementary level. It still is to an extent. Mm -hmm. We've got to kind of re bolster that work. 
but it has never existed at the high school level. Um, so part is this of what's responsive? Responsive, responsive classroom. classroom also this reward and and uh no it's a it's a different way of interacting with the kids when things go wrong um, it's a much more positive approach to discipline um, it also affects how instruction is delivered um, it's a pretty pretty big program to bring in and get people trained it probably will take two years um, but that should help out with a lot of the climate um, pieces across the school, right? A lot of the low level to mid-level behaviors, it should wipe that right out. Um, it's not a new program overall. It's a, it's a lot of around, a lot of research. Well researched. Yeah. P PBIS was a newbie that came along five years ago. It was the bandwagon that everybody jumped on across the country. And again, right. there's no, no research that is long lasting, the effects that it has. So, um, so you've got the elementary school doing that reward system, and then they flip over to the middle school middle school high school yeah. middle school high school where you're no longer so it, I, I'm just curious is that not part of the reason why we may because all of a sudden you've taken that that external control and and you've eliminated it and the kids go they don't know how to internally control themselves yeah. I mean that's been my my kids will say it drives me crazy, Mom. These the kids don't know how to control their own behavior, and so what, as you're looking at the system, are you thinking about what you're doing at the elementary school level? Because you're taking six years of training of external controlling, be you know, system, and then you're. I mean, I would think that you might think about how you might get it all to work together? Okay. Well, PB, they do have responsive classroom. They, they've had it, like I said, one of the things that we were talking about, you'll see, and you'll see it when, when we come up to it, was that, that professional development budget. Mm -hmm. They had a lot of training in it at one time, but it was never kept up on. So mm -hmm. as you get turnover, you lose the people that have the skills and the new ones right. that come in, unless you train them to have it, it starts to get diluted over time. Um, so it's there. Um, PBIS, they have invested a lot of time. The state has actually invested a lot of money um, yeah, in it as well. And I, I'm in agreement with you. There is no research out there that shows that the extrinsic motivation that the kid has to gain the rewards um, turns into anything in, intrinsic. In other words, when the rewards stop, so does the behavior. Yeah. And you're right. Uh, that's a good, good, good piece. I don't know if it's true, but it's 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 reasonable given the circumstances that one of the spikes in behaviors we see is because those rewards have now been taken away when they get over there. But again, those students at that age level, they start to get savvy, oh, it's just a bribe. Right. You know, that's right. the attitude right. about it. Right. You know, why are we doing this? They, they actually kind of come to resent it a little bit. The other piece that would come on a little bit later is training in what's called zones of regulation. And that's really teaching the students how to regulate themselves with help. In other words, are you in the red, the green, or the blue right now? Mm -hmm. um, if you are, what can we do to get you back down to the, to the green or the yellow where you can function? Um, and it takes a, a bit of training for that. Zones of regulation is for the more high-level issues that you may be seeing, the high-level behaviors that you may be seeing. So the hope is, is that we get in responsive classroom. That takes care of the, the, the vast bulk of behaviors, and then once those are out of the way, then we can concentrate on the ones that have been identified as, as much more higher need with the zones. Zones is a much simpler process. Um, this is a much more um, extensive training than, than zones is. Um, and then the other piece uh, that we've got to keep, and this is uh, 7 to 12, is that facilitated work in mathematics, ELA, science, and reading. Right? They've got to get the curriculum in. It's got to be aligned. They've got to take what they're doing and see how it fits into what they should be doing. Um, and, and make that matching and then they've got to get to the point where the elementary school is where they've got some data that they're collecting on an ongoing basis that gives them feedback on what the kids are learning and what they're not so that they can focus in on what they need to adjust to make things better. I have a question. So yeah. is there a tool like the tool that the elementary administrators just showed us for mm -hmm. at least middle school? Of them. So the track, track my progress um, goes up through ninth grade. They are using it at the high school. Um, mm -hmm. They started using it last year. 
um, the value that it had at that point in time, because um, they were still working on the, the, the mandate for the proficiency-based uh, you know, graduation requirements and the, the report cards, um, the impact that it had was the, oh my god, we thought they were doing better. Mm -hmm. uh, and so that's important uh, because that's what changes culture is it develops that sense of urgency. So they've got a sense of urgency right now, which is good. That alone lose that um, mm -hmm. in terms of the facilitation piece. So the facilitated uh, curriculum professional development, right? We kind of talked a little bit about that. Those have got to stay. And as part of that professional development piece or, or what, we call, what we're calling these orientation boot camps, um, you have teachers that leave, you have new teachers that come on, We'd like to put money aside for a week for the high school, a week for the, the elementary schools, just prior to the start of school where the newbies come in and they learn as much as they can about all these things so that they are in cultural sync with all the other teachers in the school. Mm -hmm. Doing things the same way, speaking the same language for consistency for the kids. And it's one of the ways that you don't get that dilution over time. Um, I'm gonna throw, go on to the next one here. I'm gonna throw as we go through this, you're going to see kind of two sides of the equation. So we've got what I call, or what Robin calls the draft two budget and the draft three. The draft two cuts back a lot from what we talked about at the last meeting. But in my opinion, it's still going to be too expensive. I'm going to throw it up there just for discussion purposes so people can see, you know, potential costs. The draft three is the one that I'm going to recommend to the board. Um, with the reason being is it's not going to break the bank as much as this one will. Right? So part of what will come off the list is the, the hope for that, that free full day preschool for all four year olds. There's two reasons um, for that right now. You know, unless people want to push back and argue with me. I would like to have it happen. I'm going to argue it's in my top two priorities. Um, for this district. Um, what we've got going on right now um, is we've got preschool across all three elementaries. Um, parents are having to pay for some, some is free, but we're generating revenue. We're generating a significant amount of revenue. If we move to free full day preschool for all four-year-olds next year, we lose that revenue. We're a lot of it. And the state isn't going to reimburse us for having those kids here all day long on top of that. So it's a huge expense. It's actually not that much. It's two, three hundred thousand um, to add a whole other grade of school um, for all the kids that go through here, a whole other year of, of education. But what we have now, it's up, it's running, um, it's, it's working um, for what it is, and it is generating some revenue to help offset costs. Um, so just some thoughts. I have a question. So um, I noticed there, um, Braintree has parents can can pay for that in, <coughs> in Braintree. They can come over here, or they can extend it. Um, could a parent who's at Randolph Elementary can they have their kids go over to Braintree to some deal? Well, that's what's happening now. Can yeah. Kid Brookfield do the same? Yeah. Sure. Do, do the parent, does the parent have to get out of work somehow and transport them? Or do they, um, can they go by bus? Uh, if they were going to do the after school, right. so they're, 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 it gets a little tricky. There's after school, which is kindergarten and up, mm -hmm. and then there's extended preschool. And so right. that's for the zero to four year olds. Right. So this school right now has extended preschool that will continue next year regardless of what we do mm -hmm. um, but if students were going to come here for that extended uh, preschool suggestion is is that they're here for the, the whole day oh so you, so they'd come here they'd for come preschool here for the whole, instead of going stay to through the one the, and the other yeah. ones okay until we use up and the do slots. we have all this are, are we full this school is full mm -hmm. yeah so there aren't any openings Not right now. In car Without, you know, under the current oh, system, yeah. not under, God, not potentially under the change. <laughs> <laughs> uh, both schools, uh, right, uh, Randolph and Brookfield, both schools have after after school program. Um, that's a slight pay, but that's for the K K and ups. Uh, Randolph has an after school program, but it's run by the yeah. Currently, 
So I'm not going to go into a lot on this unless people want me to. This is what would be required without the middle school move because we've taken that off the table to get the, the full day for four-year-olds up and running. Right? And again, these costs have gone up since the last time we looked at them because there's now increased health care costs for the parents. Mm -hmm. um, so what was, I believe it was about 170000 is now 233 to get the staffing um, to do this increase. If we stay steady state, we, there's some increase in here because of health care costs that didn't exist before. Um, but we also have people that are serving in those positions now that weren't intentionally built into the budget. So when we started to build stuff, we weren't able to take that into account when we did the budget process because the budget process happened a year before we decided to build stuff. So they're in there. Um, we're using other savings in the budget to pay for them, but the appropriate thing to do would be to put them in the budget proper. Um, and so this is the cost to, to maintain what we currently have. Um, and again, this generates revenue that offsets some of that. So it generates quite a bit. Yeah, I, think we were, we, I, think, I think we almost broke even last year. Um, so it was, uh, it, was, it was quite good. The other thing I've got to point out as we talk about this budget is we still don't have the, the numbers from the state to gen calculate our revenues. We don't have the enrollments that they, they need to tell us about. Um, and so that damages our conversation here because these costs in the end might not be as great as they're going to look. We're just looking at change in expenses. We've had increases in enrollments. We've had, had other changes that are bringing in money, but we can't say what they are now until the state gets done with its formula and with its um, generating the enrollments for us. So currently, um, Randolph Elementary next year, the recommendation is they stay steady state and there is no change. Braintree Elementary, okay, if we're going to stick with the more expensive draft, they really do need another teacher interventionist in here because their enrollment has gone up. They're almost at 100 kids, and we've never added a body here to help them out with that. Right? Regular classroom teacher or otherwise. I'm going to put in the recommended draft not just because of how expensive this is, right? because we've got to do something to, to, to deal with the health care piece. The one thing that I do want to keep is we have a person here, a math and ELA interventionist, who is still point two in title. Um, the problem is, is that if that person is in title, I cannot use them to teach a class even though they may be qualified and certified. Right? Title means that they're doing extra above and beyond remediation work with kids, but I can't use them. At, I can't use them as a regular classroom teacher. If I can put this point two. Um, pull it out of title, get it into the regular budget, what I can do then is I can have them teach a math class. We've been working over the last couple of years to try to get rid of the multi-grade math classes at the elementaries. Okay? Because the two smaller schools lose out in terms of time on learning and math if they're teaching grades three and four for an hour when Randolph can teach grade three for an hour and grade four for an hour. So in this situation, would you take the point two out of title or would you leave the point two in title and add another point two with the same person? Uh, this one, I would take the point two out of title for this, mm -hmm. making funds available for other things that we okay. may not be able to meet in this budget that will qualify for title funds. Okay. I, I actually had a list of them, but they're not on the top of my head right now. Okay, so I was just trying to think, like, that could be like almost half. <laughs> yeah. So that's 12. So we're not adding this. Looking at you know, twelve thousand three eighty there. So the total under the recommended budget is twelve three eighty um, increase for Braintree. Mm -hmm. For Brookfield, it's the same situation. Um, they have a uh, title interventionist. The person is full time title right now, so they can help with the kids, but they can't teach a class even though they're qualified and certified to teach a math class. If I can get point two of their position into the regular budget, I can now have them teach a math class. Okay. Um, so that's the goal there. It's, it's, it's that focus on the math piece, right? Driving towards the ends, that foundational knowledge. So looking, and again, these are different people, so their salaries are different. So this one would be 1630. RUHS, um, in taking a look at the comparables um, and, and the work that, uh, that Katie Sutton is doing um, to get her up to the comparables, we should bump her salary. Remember, there was a co-principal there at one time. 
when David David left, we we brought in Katie, Katie as an AP. Um, this is her second year that now she's gained in skills. We have her set up with a mentor through VPA as well. Um, it's appropriate to get her up um, to to an equitable salary. So that's the only change that I'm recommending for our UHS. At the district level, um, this has not really changed since we talked about it last, um, but this was the whole discussion about professional development. You cannot drive better instruction in a school, in a district, unless you've got the structures to do so. Typical structures are a <coughs> curriculum director and a PD budget. I've been able to cobble together with the coaches and with uh, Doreen Dorfman's position at our, our UHS, um, a group of people that as a team acts in the same role as a curriculum director. Right? They're the ones that are following the professional development plan together. They're the ones that are seeking out the facilitators and, and, and generating all those ideas. But we still need money to deliver the actual professional development to the faculty. So looking for, and again, a lot of this is kind of one-time money um, just to get the work done. So we've got to get some curriculum facilitators to come in. Um, at RUHS, it's, it's, it's 7 to 12, looking at the, the English language arts curriculum. It's looking at the mathematics curriculum. K to 12, it's looking at the science curriculum and building a true science program um, in the elementary schools. Um, this one, maybe, maybe not, just looking at middle school best practice just to get some ideas on how to better, right? We talked about hitting the research base, seeing what's out there, getting some better ideas on how we might structure what we have. The other piece that's up here, um, as we've been kind of looking at the testing, there are some real reading deficiencies across all the grades. So bringing in a facilitator to actually work um, with a couple of the younger grade teachers seems to be an area that needs some focus because they're new. They don't have the reading training that our old teachers had that left. Um, but more importantly, to do reading training um, with the special educators K-12. to They need some specialized training on how to teach reading to students that are struggling. It's not something that they naturally get through their regular program. Um, and we've identified that if we can provide that, we're going to be leaps and, and bounds ahead of, of, of where we are now. And again, the greater goal is starting to get kids to come off IEPs, right? Because we provided the skills for them to be independent. Um, software to support curriculum work, right? There's a variety of software packages out there. You know, Track My Progress was one. Um, we also talked a little bit about this, an $8,000 increase because uh, we had to increase the bandwidth uh, across the district. Um, we had federal money that was coming in to compensate for some of that to get us started. Um, but that funding is no longer available. It was short term anyway, so we've got to make up the difference. So that's an $8,000 increase. Athletics, um, we've cut way back on uh, in terms of what the ask was. Uh, one of the things that I've, I've added was uh, $3,000 uh, to move the athletic director over onto the teacher's pay scale. Um, the athletic director for a full time, which is unusual in most places in the state of Vermont, um, the salary was a little bit low. But one of the most important things that happened this year when Steve Croucher um, went um, to be down with his wife at her, at her new position um, at Shriners Hospital um, was the fact that we had two or three teachers who would have been ideal to come in to be an athletic director. Um, and we couldn't do it because the pay cut would have been so much because they were moving off the, the teacher's um, pay scale. So this is, would be a step to get them on the teacher's pay scale. And, you know, if we have turnover in the future, maybe we can pull from within. Uh, some, somebody who already knows the kids, who's already been a coach here in a couple of sports for a couple of years. <laughs> Good job. Um, we don't have a groundskeeper. Um, haven't had one for a while. Um, so we have a very limited staff, and we're trying to keep it fairly lean on facilities. Um, they are doing their best to kind of keep up with things. We really should have a groundskeeper. That's lines and things for the games. Um, we have a different service that comes in and actually does the, you know, mowing the lawns and whatnot uh, because it's cheaper to do that than have a, a body here to do it. Um, and then a little bit of an increase to their supplies, equipment, and police line uh, to, to, to help out to get things more in line, cost more in line what they actually are. So 38400 for athletics. Um, facilities, we pulled some stuff off because uh, we do have the healthy reserve fund. 
Um, two of the biggest items that will probably be coming before this board to be pulled from the, the reserve fund that were taken off this list from last time was $45,000 for a generator for Brookfield. Power goes out there quite frequently. Uh, they tend to get the worst weather of the three towns. And we've already had to move the kids once this year. We had to have them down at, uh, at Randolph Elementary when the power went out for an extended period of time. Once we've got them, you can't really kind of release them until the end of the day because you can't get all the parents available to pick them up and, and, and to be with them. Um, so it's important. We also took 15000 off of this, again, that we'll be asking for out of the reserve fund to replace the door hardware for security. Wait, so you so you took away the the generator? You just gonna, gonna go trans into facilities. We're gonna we're gonna come to you in about a month and say yeah. after after oh, it comes okay. back from mid say we want it from reserve funds. Oh okay. Because we got about okay. four million in there and the estimate, the rough estimate on the roof is one point eight million. Oh okay. So okay. we've got enough. So we figured, you know, rather than hit the Put taxpayers we've got yeah. money. Got it. Yeah. yeah. These are a little bit different. Um, the reason that I left these on here is because these lines were never where they should have been to begin with. This is These additions are what it's actually costing mm -hmm. right, for rubbish removal, especially now with the law that we've got to um, take the com compost um, away. Um, so this is just to get those lines up to what it's actually costing, if that makes sense. Special education is what it is. Um, it's actually significantly less than the last um, two years. Uh, and we talked a little bit about this. Um, we are in the middle, and the, the word is going out, the communications are happening with the staff and the planning is going on, of restructuring how special <coughs> education services are delivered at the elementary level. One of the reasons is because the model that we've had, um, they never had the staffing to properly serve the students. Um, they had enough staffing to manage the students, in other words, to get them through the day, but not enough time to spend with them to actually change the behaviors or provide them with the skills <coughs> they need to be independent. And because of that, again, it's an assertion based on reasonable argument and evidence, because of that, that's the reason we got 21% in this school and, and Montpelier only has 12 to 14% of its total um, student body being students on IEPs because we're never getting them off. We're getting them through, maintaining them on their IPs, providing the services, we're managing the situation, but we're not providing the skills they need to actually come off the IEPs. So the restructuring that is happening at the elementary um, level this year is designed to do just that. Um, so hopefully the goal is, um, and that restructuring in, in and of itself is cost neutral, by the way. Um, the, the goal of that restructuring um, is to change the focus to one of independence. We're not just recognizing that a kid is struggling, putting a para with them and wiping our hands of it and saying we've done our job, the kid's being served. It's no, if the para goes with them, the para is only there for a short amount of time while the team gears up its efforts to provide the services to deal with the behaviors or, or, or the, um, the academic issues that the student has as fast as possible so the para can if I'm putting a pair on a student or if a student needs to be sent out to an outplacement, that's an indication that the team needs to ramp up its efforts with that kid to, to help them be more independent and come back and be a part of the regular environment here. And so that's the goal. But we still have some predicted outplacements for next year. Um, these are students that behaviors or needs we cannot accommodate properly in the district. Um, and then um, the big thing that's happening, um, changeover that's been happening, is all the little ones that are coming in. Um, a lot of them need services, and the service that they need is uh, speech. Um, for whatever reason, whatever's happening in terms of demographics or within the community. Other. So, try to put some other pieces on here. So, predicted across district salary increase, because it's a negotiation year. And if, if we go into executive session, I'll, I'll explain what I've done with that. But it's 685398 for the salary increases. And that's keeping it relatively low. 738000 for health insurance because of the state change. That includes the 12.9% increase. 11000 for elementary science supplies. We've already talked with the facilitator and are getting her geared up to actually work this, start her work this spring with the faculty. 
Um, but she has said, you know, taking a look at, at what we've got here for our elementary schools, knows what supplies we have. Said, you, know, you want to plan for about $11,000 to buy the supplies you'll need to implement on elementary science. And here is the other kicker, is that food service, their piece of the budget is always kind of kept separate. They're their own kind of cost unit, right, because they generate their own money and try to, try to pay for themselves. Well, their health care went up, too. And there's no way they're going to be able to cover the cost um, of what the health care went up. So Robin and I were analyzing things. We said they're going to need 25000 subsidy from us um, to cover the increased cost of health care. So 738 plus 25, it's a lot. One year for health care that didn't need to happen. You can tell I'm grinding. <laughs> All right. So. The draft two budget, and again, don't, on the percentages, percentages don't mean much right now because we don't know the revenue side that may cancel some of this out. So this is all just on expenses. The draft two budget, which includes the full day preschool and the additional teacher for here, would mean a 9.26% increase in, in expenses for the district as a whole. Now this is where it gets really fun. The draft three budget, which keeps pretty much everything steady state except for some small additions, is a 7.63% increase in terms of expenses. Now this is why I'm saying it's fun. If I wipe out any increases to any school program across this district and we just deal with a health care issue, that's our cost. So is, that, is that just the health care or does it include the teachers? Salary. Teacher salaries, which we have to plan for, and I, I, when we talk in executive session, it's what I put in there is reasonable um, and not excessive. Um, but that's just health care, SPED, teacher salary increases. So the budget you're going to present is draft three? That's the budget if folks here are comfortable. Again, it's pretty much steady state with a, a couple of minor additions along the way. Primarily, um, to get a PD budget in, that's the most expensive thing, that's 100,000, um, 100 106,000, excuse me, I think total. And then the 2.2s at the small elementaries, that's all it's adding. Um, PD, you want stuff to advance in terms of academic, especially at the high school, can't do it, can't do it without it. Um, but again, my point being is that even if we cut everything, the difference between 7.49 and 7.63, is it worth it at that point in time to people? I don't know. Um, just kind of for a breakdown. This is, by the way, if we went with the draft two budget, which I'm not recommending, this is what the breakdown would look. This is the increase due to health care, increase due to salaries, Increase due to SPED, and this is all the dream, when we were back on the dream budget basically, that's what I was asking for in terms of increase to actually help programs and kids in the schools. Just so a breakdown so people can see it. So again, when I, when I say if everything looks the way that it looks, and I have confirmed with a person on the negotiating committee, but yep, that's what it is, this has decimated you know, a lot of the work. Um, other unknown here? They still haven't come up with which agreement they're going with, so there may be even more of an impact as far as I can tell. I can't anticipate what it would be. I picked up on the biggest one um, that's common between the two, um, but there potentially are a couple of other impacts. They'll be minor compared to what we've just discussed as far as I can tell, um, but that's the other one. No. And we won't have an answer to that until, at the earliest, December 15th. And it won't be until you actually have to vote on this budget in January, unless you want to do a special meeting ahead of time, that I'll be able to tell you what the revenue side of things are, because we still don't have the numbers from the state. They typically come out in the middle of the month, too. So either I put you to sleep or you're all <laughs> as grumpy and angry as I am. Does anyone have any other further questions for Elaine? On this? No. Uh, all right. Thank you. Well, the other two, just to, to throw it out there, um, 
So you got Tech Center and Raven. Um, these are really simple. Um, state hasn't worked out um, the funding. Oh, okay. So we'll talk a little bit about Raven. So what we're looking at between last year and this year in terms of tuition, it's not what it looks like, and I'll explain why in a second. It looks like tuition is going to go from 17925 to 18402 This $477 increase here um, per kid for tuition is actually really only a $101 increase. Um, the reason being is that the state is subsidizing the rest of that. So what we're looking at is a pretty much a level funded budget for the tech center. Um, their increase is 0.5%, half a percent. So um, he did a pretty good job. Um, but it is, does mean we are losing a program, which we can talk about in the executive. And that doesn't save us any money either. Losing no, because that, that program was unsubscribed this year. Mm -hmm. So we, we're still paying a teacher or we did we're, we're, we are, we are, this year we are currently paying for that teacher even though right now there are no students. Next year that teacher will be gone. So, but it doesn't save us. Yeah, because we still have some health care increases in there, right? Okay. Mm -hmm. And we also um, have the staff salary. Okay. Potential. And then Raven, um, it's the same. The actual, the whole, the whole budget for Raven was six dollars different between last year and this year. There's no impact on the tuition for Raven. Um, it may actually get a little bit better um, because we changed buildings. Um, the district charges uh, the Raven Collaborative an administrative fee because we do all the paperwork, pay all the bills, write all the checks. Um, what we are able to charge for that may change, may go down now that we're in the new building. The new building should cost less in terms of utilities and all the other stuff, but we just can't predict. And with that, that's all the budget pieces, unless there's questions on anything. That's a lot. So the expectation, um, unless there's any big uh, pieces of pushback, is the, the, the smaller of the two budgets is the push. i got to have that PD. Um, I don't want to give up the two math parts because we fought so hard and things are improving. Uh, but if I had to, that would be the next to go. Uh, that would be as vital. All right. Well, thank you. So next month we will vote on that. Um, next we've got the board members' terms. Um, it was imposed in your agenda. Both Ann Howard and Melody mm -hmm. um, are up for election in 2020. Mm -hmm. I'm not running again. I have just personal reasons, truly. Um, I've had a lot come up in my personal life recently, and I, it's been even difficult trying to come to the meetings. Um, child care, complex, trying to find coverage for So that's really what it is about. So be sorry to be, you know, leading you all. But now that I'm very, I'm part of this process, I know you all, you might see me at meetings wanting to be, uh, you know, troublemaker. Yeah, <laughs> then I get to, then I get to say something. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Hmm? Yeah. And, <laughs> Yeah, so we'll want to let um, interested people know, yeah. Randolph, mm -hmm. that there will be a vacancy. There will be a vacancy in Braintree as well. Yeah, I'm not moving. How many, year, how many, how many years are on the board? Twelve. For, for. Yeah, so thank you both for all the work you <laughs> put in. We mm -hmm. do appreciate it. Sure. Next. Well, kid through school? Yeah. No, you know, hopefully next school. So, <laughs> um, so the OSSE draft warning was also published. This is for the um, warning of the meeting, the day before town meeting, um, which is our annual school district meeting. Um, do we need to approve, vote to approve this? Right no, because we don't have figures in there okay. yet. Okay. Because there will be the budget amount, and right. then if we have any surplus. Surplus. Okay. Just distribute, just so yeah. you can see the format. Okay, just so great. you can see. What and so that is, you know, an expectation generally that we be at that meeting. That is the mm -hmm. Monday night. Um, be it held at RUHS. Please. Mm -hmm. I was the only one there last year. I was. <laughs> yes. There was nobody in the audience, though. Usually, usually there, had, like, there were several people in the audience. But it was, and there were there were a dozen or something yeah. like that. Yeah. So anyway. <laughs> what were they upset about? Thought I was the only one there. Uh -huh. 
they wanted to talk to, to the representatives from Brookfield and Brinkley. Yeah. Yeah. It's right in the middle of school break. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's school break. It's the Monday. I was somewhere. Everybody was on vacation. Yeah. I was on vacation. Discuss negotiations with Dean. Do you want to do that in executive session lane or? Uh, might, yeah, it might be a good idea just because okay. mm -hmm. the strategy. We right. talked a little openly about it on, as part right. of the budget piece, but I can tell you about the percentages they set aside. And then there's the discussion um, and approval possibly of an unpaid leave request. My uh, letter is there. I think it was. I emailed it to you. Yes. 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 So this is it's, from, um, it's in, in um, the packet. Yes. Yes. A maternity yep. leave unpaid oh. sabbatical by one of the high school English teachers. Yeah. So um, usually they get three months um, coverage, um, and then if they want more, then you know the appropriate thing to do is come to the board and ask for the leave. Um, she's looking for the first semester next year. So no wait. So the semester being until the end of December. Yeah. Yeah. So January twenty. Do we have any other questions for Lane about this or discussion? No. Do you have well, I recommend it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, yep, strongly so. Because she's going to be missing the first couple months anyway, so it would yeah. almost make it yeah. more sense. To it might make it easier to hire a long-term sub. Yep. Mm -hmm. yep. And it's in it's in a. It's in it's in English, so English is easier to find than you know a, a math mm -hmm. or, or physics or chemistry. Um, it's, it shouldn't be a problem finding somebody who's qualified. Mm -hmm. uh, do I have a move to approve the leave? Motion to approve. Second. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, so the leave is approved. Um, then we have two reports, two point four and two point five. Um, this is a first read of both of them, so we will actually approve them next time. Do you have anything you want to say? Um, yeah, these were these were actually pretty short. I'll do two five first because that's the easy <coughs> one. That's the, the succession planning. Right? If I get run over, I'd buy a bus, have a heart attack, you know, men mental instability, <laughs> that, that sort of stuff. Um, is having somebody who can kind of step in and do the role. So I've actually got two. Um, in the short term, it's Robin. So like if it's a couple of days, um, because most of what we deal with out of the central office is budget related. So she's got a good handle on the operations and everything that happens. If it's longer than five days, it's Erica. So any, anything for extended, because she's got the whole, the whole ball of wax, um, can, can step up and, and do things quite, quite wonderfully. Um, but there's no reason to pull her away from her, her um, principal duties if it's just for a couple of days. Um, and I, they both do have a letter in there um, that um, at worst, um, if it was required um, to, for the signing authority, there might be an organization or an institute that we have contracts with that might say, yeah, we just need a board chair so we on it as well. Just the same that this is the case. Um, the other part of that is that in terms of just keeping um, people up to date and what's going on in the district uh, to make it easier to kind of step in uh, is I do meet individually with each of the principals, each of the cabinet members once a week um, and we also have our cabinet meeting every other week. So every two weeks which we're looking at everything that's going on in the district, kind of brainstorming together, um, checking in on um, the good works that are in progress and what the next steps are. Um, so they're pretty well involved in, in what's happening across the district. So that's 2.5 unless there's questions. And then 2.4 uh, financial planning and budgeting. Um, the biggest, kind of easiest way to sum this up is it's just, it's ensuring that we're putting proper thought and research um, into the budget planning process, um, right? Um, and making sure that we're kind of anticipating outside pressures like the change in the state of healthcare um, as we're, we're, we're planning out. A um, couple of ongoing issues that are now resolved I think it's important to talk about. Um, one is the, the issue with the treasurer. Um, if folks will remember, we had um, an elected official um, who was managing the accounts payable. And the big issue was not reconciling um, the checking accounts um, that those checks are drawn from every year, and we got a finding in the audit for it. Because it was an elected official, we really had no power other than to put pressure and say, please do this, which we did. Um, but we were able to get 
somewhat forceful at the end of last year and force a change um, in that position. So that issue has been resolved. Um, we did get a letter um, from the AOE just a little while ago, middle of November, that says, nope, we've checked things out. Um, and we like how you've resolved things. Um, you're good to go. Um, so they, they have no concerns at this point in time. Um, the other one, um, which was kind of interesting that had gone on for a couple of years, was year after year we were carrying a deficit over um, for the technical center, which under Vermont state law you can only do for three years. Um, but it was because of this conflict in the laws. Um, on the books, they are required to have an assistant director for adult ed. Adult ed doesn't really exist um, in the technical centers anymore because the state put in a bunch of adults basic ed offices. Um, which drew all the people to them and away from um, the technical centers. Um, but we still have to have the, the person there. So we whittled that position down and the salary down as much as we could while still meeting the letter of the law. But it meant that we always um, were in a deficit situation at the end of each year because typically that person is generating revenue to cover their position. With no people um, to come in and do it, um, there was always a deficit. Now, we, we did some checking. Um, RTCC does have a surplus. Typically, at the end of the year, it's a small one. It's built up a bit, um, and it is OK. You know, we check with the auditors and whatnot um, to pay for that uh, deficit with that surplus. So we have done that, actually notified the board about it last year. Um, so that was corrected at that time, and that's how we'll continue to correct it. But I'll notify the board each year um, when we do that. I have a question about that. Um, if we're violating the law, in the, in the first place, just in the nature of the way it's set up. Why don't we violate it no, we by did. getting we, rid of it? We, we, we actually, we, we fixed it before the three years was up, so we didn't violate. But what you're going be taking money out of surplus in order to pay for it, and that yep. violates the law. I that, that actually, they said, doesn't. It was, it was kind of interesting, and I think it's the shade between meanings. We were not allowed to pay tuition money for it, but because this was now surplus, it wasn't considered tuition money anymore. <laughs> That's the, which was the explanation. But we can't that. do without an adult ed uh, right. director. Still on the books. All right. We so talked we about that. this before. Right. Well, I brought it. I did bring it up, and because I do do yeah. meet with our local. Right, then that's where, as our role to advocate with the legislature, we should be hammering on them. Get rid of this ridiculous rule the other, other so thing, that we don't have to do this. The other thing to add to that list is um, pay us more for preschool. Mm -hmm. okay. If we have full day preschool, we should yeah. be getting more than the 3300 um, So we, because in February we meet with them. Mm -hmm. yeah. So we should make sure that's, you know, front and center, two of the things that we should talk to them about. So, uh, Lane, I had a question about the uh, policy 2.4. In, in the beginning, the, it has this uh, subscript, superscript, and uh, or italics, whatever, and it says, or failed to be derived from a multi-year plan. And, mm -hmm. and it, it's always said this, and every year I don't, I feel like we don't actually have a multi-year plan, with the exception of facilities. I, I believe facilities, we <coughs> we see. I mean, you you have it right here. You just gave it to us. And that's usually a pretty good multi-year plan, but I don't see that for anything else. And so CIP is what I use. Yeah, but what? So as an example, your your plan to, to this year uh, for next year's was to add a uh, the sixth grade to the middle school, right? Yeah. And but I didn't hear any talk about that last year. And it's the same thing with like the the preschool and stuff. I I, I just wonder if you could do a better job in the, because in your interpretation it doesn't mention at all about multi-year. Uh, you talk about, uh, you know, proper fiscal management, which I guess one could assume that you're talking about multi-year planning there. But I, I just wonder if, if you could do a, a, perhaps a better job of presenting maybe the plan for, like, uh, I, don't, I don't know, you choose three years or something, or I know we have to, in my mind, I was thinking that logical choice would be the contract cycle, because every, mm -hmm. so we, in this case, it's what can be two years for the teachers, because the medical plans could be two years, so perhaps you present a two years, over the course of the next two years, I think this is what my budgeting might look like, you know, like something like that, that would, I don't know, at least present us with what you're going to be proposing over the course of the next two years, instead of 
waiting until like October, November time frame and then saying, all right, this is what I like to do. And it, I just felt like yeah. it came out of left field. So, and I, so I'm, I'm in agreement with you, but I, I can at least give you some context in terms of how things have been happening. Um, and also, you know, suggest that the strategic planning that was talked about at the board level, you know, right. would be helpful for that. Yes. Um, what happens um, in the process that I've been using for budgeting is that CIP plan is a three-year plan, um, two right. to three years. Um, it uses data um, to analyze where the weaknesses are in the district, and then I actually state what those weaknesses are um, and what things that we will be attempting to do. Um, so it is stated in there. But the other piece that goes in terms of, if you go back, you look at the last two, and I think I dropped it in the Google file. You guys can take a look, look and I'll put the previous ones in there. Because it gets adjusted every year, because then you go back and look at the data again, and then you might be able to say, oh, we've kind of completed this one, so instead we're going to be focusing on, on this right now. Um, but in terms of that planning process, it is not necessarily spelled out what the solution is going to be. Mm -hmm. We've identified this is a problem. We need to work on this, and then over the course of the communications with the cabinet, we start to pull those pieces out as budget season approaches and says, hey, we've got some issues here, and that's where the preschool, the whole preschool concept came up, and then moving the sixth um, grade up, you know, came out of that as well. But I, I see where you're going. But th there, is, there is a process that is related, but you're right in terms of the clarity piece, I'm, I'm in agreement. I, I guess for, for me, what would be helpful is, as an example, uh, this presentation you just did was great, right? But I, I think what would be more helpful for me would be your first presentation, instead of being a pie-in-the-sky presentation, it would be the presentation, all right, over the course of the next three years, this is what we're going to do. And then, in no, uh, so maybe in October, that's what that is. Then November, you're narrowing it down to, all right, so what we've come up with, these are the solutions that we have for the next year to chip away at our three-year plan. And then in December, all right, this is what we would like you to do. And I, I think that, it, for me, it would, it would seem more logical because uh, that first one that you presented, I, I thought it was October, mm -hmm. uh, it was this pie in the sky, all the teachers want all of these things, and I couldn't put that into context to, all right, so last year I thought we had the pie in the sky, and now we have another pie in the sky, and I thought we met a ton of it with the amount of money we, we, we tried to put towards it. And so I, I couldn't contextualize it. And, and, and so I think it would be helpful for me to see, all right, this is the increase I'm, I'm talking about. This is where I kind of want to go. Yep. And it, that would help me anyway. I, uh, just to and I, 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 think it's, I think it's very, very good. It's easy to do. Um, but I would caution that, you know, it will be general. You know, right. the thing that, yeah. we, thing that people and, and Pat and David mentioned, the thing that people know we've been working on is the mathematics at the... Right. I mean, I completely and so we've understand been, that. So the laws are going to change. Yeah. I get all that. So we've been, we, we have been chipping away at it for three years. So they'll be general. We'll, we'll, our focus is, right now, our focus is improving REUHS in the, in the middle school. Yep, of course. Yep. And, but what form that takes will change as we're discussing it in more detail, as more data comes up as we complete some pieces that we're working on and if they have the desired impact. So yeah, so as long, so I would, it, it's not a problem at all, um, but just recognize that it may be general. Yeah. Uh, there are some pieces that we have worked out the details on for a while um, and getting those bullets down, but recognize it's changeable, it's general. But if I'm changing it, then I should have a good explanation for why. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, no, agreed. And I think that's helpful for people in general to think about these are our, our long-term goals, like yeah. a, a mm -hmm. middle school for instance, is a long-term goal, and that's where we're working. Yep. Mm -hmm. Maybe. I mean, that may change, but you can present it as a long-term goal that allows people to sort of get their head around yep. it as, as a, you know, a direction we're moving rather than, a, you know, immediate focus. Yeah. No, because uh, you're right. I mean, we had the focus of addressing addressing 7th, 8th grade in RUHS. <coughs> um, it was a two-year wait because of the other work that they were doing, but this was what we were coming up with mm -hmm. as, you know, things that may have a significant impact. But yeah, no, I'm in agreement. Um, the the CIP plan is that that's this continuous improvement, improvement plan. plan. Right. That's yeah. generated by the state, or that's so generated by working. you. So I work together, work together with the principals. Okay. Um, they have school improvement plans. Um, the two support each other. Um, they have to. 
but it comes from an analysis of the data. It comes from a lot of um, discussions at the open forums in terms of what we're getting from community feedback. It comes in part from you know some of the priorities that the board has as well. You, in this case, in terms of your mission statement. Um, but that is pulled together. Again, it, it's got to be database. So it, it says these are our deficiencies as we see them. <coughs> this is the reason why we've identified them as deficiencies. This is the data that we used, and this is what we're going to do about it. And you have to give that to the state, is that Year, right? Uh, yearly. Yeah. Yeah, and you guys usually approve it yeah. um, each year. But I, I did drop the, the last one. Um, <coughs> again, you guys have a, you each have an email now. Mm -hmm. There is a Google Drive um, that I believe Tina sent you the link to. I actually yes. have your Chromebooks as well. They're sitting in my car, but I was parked a quarter mile away, so making a few trips is a little tough to me. <laughs> um, uh, so what's going forward, the policies will be in there. All the, those yearly documents will be there, in there. They'll be in folders. There's a folder in right now. there right now. This is OSSD board meetings. And if you open it up, it's got by meeting day, you know, 12 9. Mm -hmm. It's got all the documents in there. And what we'll do with that, instead of necessarily, you know, Linda having to email out a giant mm -hmm. file once a week mm -hmm. as they're ready before that date, they'll drop them in so that if you want to get started reading a little bit earlier, it'll be there. Um, but any of the documents that I've got that, that you want, just tell me, I'll drop them in there. Um, it would be helpful for me if you <coughs> put, like, the PowerPoints yep. in there. I find Linda's email very helpful as yes. a reminder. Doesn't mean we don't have a reminder yeah. for yeah. the meeting. Yeah, I well, probably still would do that. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> you can have a meeting okay, reminder, but you don't have to yeah. do all the things ahead to you guys. Yeah. So, and when you're writing up the evidence, you could just list there's the CIP yeah. plan in the district office or wherever you keep it. Yep. Yeah. You don't have to yeah, write up the plan in this yeah. document. Well, they they had talked plan. about. At one of our trainings, I think it was with Val, about trying to incorporate the evidence directly into the report. Mm -hmm. And right. so that's one of the reasons why some of the samples, in some cases I can't, there's bigger stuff, so that'll be in the folder. Mm -hmm. um, so well, then, I think this is a public document too, and so mm -hmm. I think it's important for any mm -hmm. of our mm -hmm. yeah, public yeah. also to be able to get their hands on it rather than have to go to the website. So I do appreciate those sorts of things being incorporated into the report. But that is a change from you know previous years, yes. and that just came out of Val. So in that um, meeting we had the training, I think it was last month. Or it was, maybe the 20th of yeah, right? November. It's yep. all running. Oh, but uh, she mentioned something about, um, she thought it was odd that the surplus, it was something about title funds. You mentioned that we wait until we get the title funds, and then at the end of the year we end up having a surplus sometimes due to the fact that we had to put it in the budget. Do you recall what I was talking about? And then she mentioned... Well, usually you put that into a reserve, so you draw from that temporarily, and then you don't have to worry about it year to year or something. It was something like that. Do you do you recall? No, the, title funds. What what ends up happening with us with with title funds is we get we get a significant amount. I was actually going to screw. Maybe it was state funds. You, you there was something you said you had to pad the beginning because the money oh. doesn't show up yeah. until like yeah. December. So so we get a lot of reimbursement. Right. Um, <laughs> so let's say I've got a I've got a student who's going to a uh, special education student who's going to cost me three hundred and eighty thousand dollars, and we had one. Um, we had actually the most expensive student in the state for about a year, year and a half. Um, because I know I've got to pay that, I've I've mm -hmm. got to put it in the budget to make sure that there's money available for it. Mm -hmm. But what what ends up happening is um, we've got to pay the money up front. And then later in the year, lots of times at the end of the year, I get reimbursed for part of it um, from the state. Mm -hmm. um, you know, do you, do, do I? Call, she, she's mentioned something about you. <coughs> there's there's a, a best practice of something setting that money aside somehow so that you draw from it reoccurring so you, that the, the budget doesn't actually increase or, or something. Like I can that. I can find out. Maybe um, ask. Yeah. I don't know if that's part of the, like the long term. When I was thinking long term, if we if there's a reoccurring expense due to uh, you know, reimbursement. Uh, yeah, a lot of a lot of these aren't predictable. Okay. You know, those kids come and go. Okay. Uh, that's one of the reasons why it's it's it, it's also hard to serve them is the the, the transitory. Uh, but I'll actually right. check. I'll talk with Robin to see if there are some things we could do that with. All right. Um, but the reim there's two places that surplus primarily comes from. It's reimbursement monies that come at the end of the year that you had to pay for up front. Mm -hmm. um, the second place is staffing. Right. Um, yeah. If you know, like I said, you said, you get somebody who retires at at, at seventy five thousand a year, um, and you hire somebody at forty five thousand. 
Right. So of course. yeah, there's a, there's a lot of that that goes on into it too. But I will check. So reoccurring reimbursement. Are there any other questions for Lane on these reports? Mm -hmm. Um, please remember that we will be voting to approve them next time, so if you want to see the documentation, they are available in the OSSD office um, and the notebooks in Lane's office. Okay, so uh, next thing we have is to plan meeting with legislators. What is... Lynn is going to reach out and try to set it up. I will. Okay. Yeah. And that meeting will be at RUAHS, correct? Yes. Okay. So are we sure we want that to happen in February, right before... Melody and Ann leave us. Mm -hmm. We get new people in position. Is it better that it happens then because we have experienced people well, on Well, there's a reason why we have it then. And because for they're their doing their legislation. Yeah, because yeah. we yeah. want to ask them questions, you know, before too long on in the term because when they right. do the crossover at town mm -hmm. meeting week, yeah. um, then basically right. there's no new things. There's nothing. Left. They're only there for five, what, five months, six months. Right. Right. So we can bring up our two things. Okay. Right. <laughs> and just that's usually the answer. reason. We used to do it in January. And then right. it was budget, and it was a it really was a, a grind. It was yeah. a long, really long meeting. meeting. Really okay. long meeting. <laughs> so we moved. February sounds good. Okay. Yeah, we okay. don't really want to be here till ten thirty. All right. So <laughs> for the uh, consent agenda, we need to approve the minutes from the OSSD meeting. Um, did, did anyone have any changes on that? Um, we also have to approve a professional contract for someone who is already working. Um, and. We will do this as a slate, and then we need to approve the uh, financial management questionnaire, which is something I had. It's yeah, this it's thing. In, um, right? No, yeah, in the, in the orange thing. folder. Yeah, yeah, you're right. This just sort of delineates who's responsible for different um, parts of financial management in the district. So, if you, I mean, if you want to look at that, that's just sort of between the OSSD office and our district treasurer. So, are there any questions or substitutions or changes? Any of those things? Mm -hmm. um, do I have a motion to approve the consent agenda as a slate? I'll move it. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay, the consent agenda is approved. Um, move on to superintendent's report. Is there anything you want to add? I do have a question about the policy, um, policies, policy meeting, policy review meeting that happened last Thursday that I did not attend because I was sick. Rachel, you were there. Um, Liz yes. Sue Siglas. Yes. Are, is there anything you need to do or know or uh, prepare for as far as a board? <laughs> You're making me think back off the cuff. It's <laughs> tough to do sometimes. <laughs> there, we need to re we need to review our policies and basically adopt the ones they have on their website. They're, they're Is that basically what? Yeah. Okay. So there, there were there were two we that were three just three out and out missing, um, and so we we talked with her um, about you know can we do them all at once? Mm -hmm. You know should we do them a couple at a time? Um, and. I think the, the best way to kind of start the process through the discussion was to, to get those two that are missing up and on there um, right off the bat and then do the rest all at once. And whose responsibility is that to get those two? Um, I'm happy to do the, the writing and whatnot on it. Okay. Um, the other piece um, is to, is um, when, when the board has done kind of its review process on them, they've looked at them and say, yeah, this sounds okay to us, is before there's a vote is run it all through PHO. Um, okay. Just to make sure it's it's it's. If it's standard, probably the VSBA has, has the standard wording that. and all that. Yeah, okay. yeah no. If, if, uh, I think w what she said was, um, you know, if you if if you're going to adjust any of ours a little bit, then you do want to send it to council, which right. makes sense. Yeah. Right. There were some specific instances where she said check with your council on this, yeah. and then a lot of the detail can come out of ours and be put in procedure procedural stuff. Yeah, she said the kind of procedures out of our. Policies. Yeah, because that's that's operational. That's on on the, the on the district side as opposed to the board side. Yours is the overall vision for the policy and, and, and what it entails. Ours is to how to how do we interpret it and put it into practice. Um, and so, if you've got that mixed up in the policies, those pieces should come out. Okay. And then that means I'm going to have to go to and, and check and make sure that all the policies are or the procedural side of things are all somewhere. All the 
do that. So you'll. So maybe we should do the that's, procedure. That's maybe we should do the policies and we do the procedures. Now. Yeah. So he now, has procedures. He, we do he, policies. And he actually does all these state ones because his, he just has to make sure they're all up and and running. We don't do those policies. He makes sure we can help him using our ability to use the VSBA to help create those policies, but he really, yeah, he no, needs to make sure that we have all the most current state policies, federal policies in place, and that they're up to date. Because we delegated that to him to do. And that's where, that's where the review of those policies came from, is when I was going through doing the, that executive limitation. Um, you know, so it's making sure that the board is, you know, keeping a track of what needs to change in those, and that's why I had the review done last year. Right. Yeah, it took a while to get them to do it, but they did a did a pretty good job. Good. Um, and hopefully, it saved you time and effort to have them do it. Yeah, I can't even predict how long it'll take yeah. to, to update um, it'll, uh, until I actually get started. Yeah. But um, I think the first first step, just so we go through the process together, is that those those two that are missing. Um, and then once everybody's happy and satisfied with how that process works, we just do the same for all the rest and all mass. Okay, and our packets were also the director and principal's reports. Uh, financial report, is there anything that you want to highlight or have yeah. us note, make note of? I had some minor notes, but nothing really, nothing that's critical. Um, yeah, not the only folks that are spending a little faster than we like right now, and they're actually not, not that bad, um, is facilities, um, just because of all the work they're doing. They're spending a bit more than I'd like because of overtime. Um, they've lost some folks or done away with some folks, and so other people have had to step in because they're hourly, they get overtime. Um, but it is, you know, we're 40% through through the school year for the most part, and they still got 55% of their budget left. So, you know, it'd be nice to say they were 60, had 60% 60 left on that calculus. So they're, they're a little bit ahead of where we'd like, but they'll be fine. Any questions uh, mm -hmm. for on the finances? Again, the last question I asked Robin after we review it is, are you comfortable with everything in here? And she said everything is fine. Okay. So. Well, that's great. <laughs> that's a good rubber stamp. Anything else we should know under incidental? Uh, not that I can. Some Melody. stuff for executive session. But. Yeah. Melody, how do we do? I think we did pretty well. Board evaluation. Yeah, I'm going through it now. Like the general behavior, I, I mean, look at it, it's 9 o'clock. It's <laughs> stuck right to. Um, we followed the agenda, didn't get sidetracked. You know, well attended, someone was sick, that's going to happen. Um, I don't think there were any interruptions. I think that Laura did a great job keeping us on track, especially with the public comment section, trying to keep us, you know, on task and, and holding them to the time limits. Um, always asking at the end of every session, um, anyone have any questions, thoughts? Or, so I think, um, and it was pretty, you know, straight to the point in terms of what we went over today. There wasn't a lot that I think we needed to debate or discuss. So um, attentive, listening. Um, we're all respectful and courteous, and I think a lot of trust and openness generally is my overall feel. And then just in terms of the governance principles review, um, we did go over some of that actually, like the, you know, the processes, policies, who's in charge of what, and just kind of, you know, maybe we have work to do in um, monitoring and improving process. I know that you've been putting that on the agendas routinely, so, but that's always something that we could improve upon <coughs> and yeah I, th I think that we really kept we stayed in our lane <laughs> <laughs> thank you thanks for reporting mm -hmm. um, and we do have an executive session both on negotiations and on the student issues so um, we will move into the executive session mm -hmm.